right, we'll call this meeting to order. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This meeting of the East Troy School District Board of Education and all other meetings of the board are open to the public in, compli in compliance with the state statute. Notice of the meeting has been sent to the media and or has been publicly posted in an attempt to make the citizens of the district aware of the time, place, and agenda of this meeting. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda as posted. Okay, discussion? All in favor of approval, say aye. 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 Opposed? Agenda is approved. Then we have the meeting minutes of February 14th and the 28th and the 7th. second hey okay, discussion changes comments all in favor of approval say aye. aye 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 opposed minutes are approved public participation is there anybody in the audience that would like to speak tonight I also have a few letters to read but I'll start with the audience first and if you could just state your name sure my name is Jean Freund um, and I am here because I am the middle school counselor and I was made aware last week that my position as a school counselor um, is not going to be renewed and I wanted to reach out to explain why I think it's important to do so. I was hired as a new employee this year on a one-year contract. I was told that the position may not continue due to budgetary reasons, but the longer I have been here, the more I have realized how much this position is needed. Not a single day has gone by where a student or staff member did not reach out for some sort of support. Every day, our pupil service team is busy supporting our students and staff in a variety of ways. As a team, we meet regularly to discuss the needs of students and how we can best support them, reviewing safe schools data regarding bullying, harassment, or unsafe situations. We have dealt with numerous situations this year often tag teaming or coming together to find the best solution for our students. We go into classrooms to teach both character education and academic and career planning. We serve in leadership positions on committees and PBIS teams in order to support our students and encourage them to make positive choices. We help cover classes when needed and assist in hallway and lunch duty, which gives us an opportunity to reach students in a different and unique way. We support students individually and in small groups. Since the start of the year, I have had over 700 individual student contacts of need. Some of those lasted five minutes, others as much as 45 minutes. Sometimes I am seeing the same student multiple times throughout the day to give them the support that they need. I have helped students with attendance issues work through whatever was going on so they could return back to class and learn instead of leaving school and the learning environment. I have worked with students experiencing anxiety, sometimes in the midst of a panic attack, students who are grieving, sometimes from the loss of a parent, and students that are being abused or neglected. When, student, when working with a student, together we come up with strategies to help them in the future so that they can work through whatever their struggle might be. Sometimes that may be a referral to an outside agency, but at this time it can take several months for students to start to receive services because of the mental health needs in our country at this time. In the meantime, I can continue to support students here at school until they can receive the support they need. I have worked individually with many students who are experiencing friendship issues. We talk about what they can do to make sure they are engaging in healthy relationships and being a good friend to others. Something else that has helped with this issue are the classroom guidance lessons that I teach to every grade level every other week enabling me to work with every student in the building. We work on things such as setting goals, how to be a better listener, seeing things through other people's perspectives, developing values, conflict resolution, how to control emotions, learning strategies for self-regulation, having empathy for others, the importance of community, 
and how to have a positive impact on our community. I have seen positive changes in the classrooms since I began teaching these lessons. And I am concerned that if this position no longer exists, that these lessons may not continue. These are life skills that are essential for students to learn so that they can have healthy relationships with others and be successful in life. I also created a Google Classroom for students in each grade level. In it, there are strategies and tools that they can use to help calm their bodies, such as breathing techniques, grounding, calming coloring activities, relaxing videos and music, jigsaw puzzles, and more. Students are able to use these resources both at school and home, and they have expressed that they are helpful when they are trying to regulate their emotions. I have worked with several students who have sensory needs, collaborating with teachers to help them understand tools and strategies to help these students be successful. I have also worked with students who may not be able to commu communicate verbally at times and come up with strategies that I then shared with others to help facilitate communication with the student, enabling us to assist them with whatever they needed. There have been a number of students engaging in self-harm or suicidal ideation, and I have worked with them and their families to make sure they are receiving support. I have worked to educate students on technology and how to protect themselves, as well as work with Officer Hackett when issues have arisen with technology at the middle school. We have had instances where students were not using technology in an appropriate way, and other times when students were communicating with people they did not know, and it became a safety issue. I have earned the trust of students very quickly and had several students notify me about concerning situations, including incidents with phones involving at least two possible predators that were targeting our students and worked with Officer Hackett to try to resolve these issues. I have also worked to educate parents on technology by sending out information through newsletters and sometimes working with them individually in regards to their student and what was happening at school. I have had the pleasure of starting a board game club during Lunch and Flex this year and regularly have about 20 students who attend. It is an opportunity for students to come together and get to know others they may not normally spend time with, have fun playing games, and work on social skills as well, even if they don't realize it. I have seen some new friendships develop from this club. I have also helped with Ski Club this year, which allowed me to establish connections with students I had not had before. One of my jobs is to advocate for my students, and that is exactly what I am trying to do here tonight. It has been a pleasure to serve the students, families, and staff of the East Troy Community School District, and given the chance, I would welcome being able to continue to do so. Thank you, Jean. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, anybody else like to speak? Is this thing on? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Hi, I'm Gene Rosemarinowski with the East Troy Area Conservatives. Uh, good evening, board members, staff, and public. I'm just here for a short announcement letting you know that the East Troy Area Conservatives have the pleasure of presenting Dr. Duke Pesta. Dr. Duke is one of America's foremost authorities on the dangerous influences of decisive issues in education. The session will be held on Thursday, March 17th, 6.30 p.m. at the East Troy Bible Church at 2660 North Street. And then there will be a question and answer period after the presentation. Everyone is welcome to attend. Doors open at 6 o'clock. Admission is free. And don't forget to vote in the election. April 5th. Thank you. Thanks, Gene. Mark? Yeah, just reading on behalf of Sue Winarski here. Um, so to the East Troy Community School Board members, I cannot attend the school board meeting due to a prior personal commitment on Monday, March 14th but I would like to give my opinion on the elementary keyboarding position being dropped for the next school year. I started this program in 1991 as a pioneer in elementary keyboarding, just like the Smart Lab was several years ago. Elementary keyboarding all started in Dr. Hibner's current office. 
It is very disappointing that after 21 years of elementary keyboarding, this program is set to be cut. Typing, keyboarding is a life skill as current documents and daily information is on a computer or another device. The elementary keyboarding classes are the only time all students will receive instructions for the proper technique of typing. The middle school and high school programs are electives and students are not required to take them. If this program is cut, how are students going to learn the basics of technology usage and digital life skills? The elementary teachers are not certified for all the skills learned. Elementary keyboarding just doesn't teach you how to type. I am teaching students valuable tools in Google Docs, spreadsheet, and slides. Fourth graders learn how to format an MLA style report, insert tables and hyperlinks into a document and proofread their work. The fourth graders reinforce their typing skills while working on projects like this. Students also learn the numbers and symbols of the keyboard in fourth grade. Fifth grade learners spend a lot of time learning the basics of spreadsheets. They learn the, the tools, the function keys, the programming basic formulas, and how to use the numeric keypad. Google Slides is also taught in fifth grade as the students create their presentations. Regardless of the elementary grade level, all students would continue to work on typing speed, accuracy, and good technique. By cutting the elementary keyboarding program, you are also affecting so many teachers at Prairie View. The teachers are overwhelmed with other teaching duties, and now this proposal would just add to this situation. The classroom teachers will be losing 60 in third grade or 45 in fourth and fifth grade minutes during the week on planning time, and now would be adding prep for teaching my classes. I wanted the board to know exactly what is being taught in elementary keyboarding. I feel that the students at East Troy Community Schools would be losing a benefit in cutting this program. Sincerely, Sue Winarski. Thanks, Mark. Uh, anybody else like to speak? Uh, excuse me, I, I forgot to mention that all the school board members have been invited to Dr. Duke Pesta's um, presentation, and there are some flyers that look like this on the back table with details if anybody wants them. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Anybody else like to speak? Sure. So I had a colleague that wasn't able to be here tonight, but he just shared some thoughts. And so if I'm able to read those off through his email, I sure. would appreciate that. Um, so the thoughts that he had regarding the counseling position was that students will need to wait longer for counseling or supports, uh, which in his experience equates to students ultimately not asking for supports and showing frustration as classroom withdrawal or behaviors. There would be less proactive programming, such as developmental guidance, character education, or facilitation of mentoring programs. There would be less ability to support programs geared towards gifted and diverse learners. One less pupil services professional will equate to proportionally more time for the remaining pupil services needing to deal with case management, discipline, psychological testing and reporting, clerical work, program development, and staff development rather than the ability to respond to student concerns in a timely manner and directly serving children. While we can itemize the direct impacts this move may have on students and other pupil service members, ultimately it communicates that we are okay with doing enough just to get by. By cutting a school counselor, we are not cutting the need for that school counselor. We are saying those needs will not be met or will be met by other people who have used their existing roles to stretch across to other areas already. We are saying that children can wait. This is by no means a way to improve, nor is it a way to even maintain the status quo, which has already not been sufficient against state standards or district expectations. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Jean. Anybody else like to speak? <coughs> Excuse me. 
Excuse me. Uh, my name is Ryan Stoichoff. Um, I have three students here at, uh, at East Troy Community School. And I guess uh, the only thing I'd like to say is simply this. The fact that we're having a discussion about cutting education simply says <clears throat> we are either naive or we're ignorant. Neither one of them is an excuse. Education for our children, our children's children, at this point in time should be of the utmost importance. Regardless of agendas, regardless of budgets, regardless of how you feel about how money is spent, education should be our number one goal as parents, as administrators, and as citizens of this community. I don't know who makes the decision on this, but please do not cut one position from janitor to principal to vice principal to aide. Every one of them is integral in educating our children and it would be a shame to lose any of them in this day and age. And that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else here? Okay. Um, I do have one letter, or I have a couple of, a few of them actually. Um, I'll start out um, to the East Troy Community School District Board of Education. According to the Education Trust, nearly one in five students don't have access to a school counselor at all. That's eight million children with no support system. For those of you that don't remember middle school, it is hard. These are the years where st when students start to figure themselves out as individuals. Mental health in our current society is at a pivotal, pivotal time. We have the ability to continue to express the idea that our mental health is just as important as our physical health. What kind of message are we sending middle school students when there is no counselor in the building for them? Or if we went with a shared counselor, does that send the message that your mental health only sometimes matter because we only have a counselor in the building sometimes? I understand to make budget cuts, but at what cost? Our classroom teachers have been stretched so thin over the last few years. It seems asinine to throw something as important as mental health on their plate as well. As a classroom teacher, I fear the day that I can no longer focus on providing rigorous instruction because the well-being of the students will need to be addressed first. On any given day, I fill a role, role as a teacher, parent, confidant, curriculum designer, evaluator, instructional coach, technology coach, and role model. I am our building technology coach, peer mentor, design and implement innovative robotics and STEAM curriculum, ski club advisor, boys and girls, varsity soccer coach, and sources of strength advisor, amongst other things, and cannot fathom the thought of being a counselor as well. It is my understanding that different options will be discussed if this position is not cut. One of the op options could be that the high school and middle school will now share a counselor. If you think about the sheer number of students affected by this, it seems ignorant to think that this w role will be fulfilled at a competent level. This has no reflection on who the counselors will be, but rather the caseload they will have to take on. I'm not sure what other options you will discuss, but I look forward to hearing them. Again, I fear the negative impact eliminating this pos position will have on the students and staff in the school district. Sincerely, Aaron Judd. East Troy Middle School STEAM and Robotics Facilitator. I have a letter addressed to uh, the school, uh, school board. First and foremost, please know I understand the difficult position that the school board and our administration has in general, but especially when we are facing deficits. I know the hours you spend together during discussing this, but that certainly doesn't account for the hours you research, communicate with the community, and the nights you lay in bed just pondering the back and forth. It's a challenging position, and I am grateful for your time and consideration. I was genuinely surprised last Monday when I learned that a pupil service position at the middle school was being cut. I immediately thought of our students and families that have worked closely with the staff member in the last year. There have been countless crisis situations where the staff member has intervened and been successful at giving the students the, the care they needed or connected them to the appropriate services. 
Having this addition at the middle school has allowed me to focus on my efforts on restorative practices for discipline measures, take on more behavioral intervention groups, take on more supervision, and allowed for students and families to access more support with a team of two counselors. At our first parent and teacher conferences, we had numerous parents share how much of an impact the staff member had on their child's experience at the middle school. That was just with having her in our building for five weeks at that point. This staff member has also been able to establish more character education lessons than any pupil service member in the last 10 years. She has been able to see the 6th, 7th, and 8th grade students every other week for character education. Not only do our students and families rely on this position, but so do, but so do our staff. The staff is quick to acknowledge that the asset the staff member has had uh, been to our building. She's in, all for, she's in all for our students, and she's not afraid to insert her help and resources whenever and wherever she can. With my background in school counseling, I recognize that impact needs and direction need to be based on data. So I want to share some figures with you. The staff member has over 700 contacts with students just this year. I have just short of 650 contacts with a slightly different role. This individual staff member has taken the lead on our attendance concerns as well and has been hands-on with Officer Hackett in these efforts. There have been six students that are now attending more regularly thanks to her efforts. Of these students missed, of these students missed most of the entire first semester. For the first time in a very long time, I feel like I have a pupil service team. While having a full-time psychologist has been extremely beneficial, their role in our building is much different than a school counselor's role. The school counselor is accessible to all students while the school psychologist spends the most time with our gifted and talented students and our students with IEPs and learning differences. The staff member has her door open and is revolving with the students and teachers all day long. The need for our positions is high. I also recognize that this cut would mean that someone would need to absorb additional duties. This wouldn't be just her duties, but it would also be my own because I would need to be more available for other counseling uh, positions. Currently, I have half the students on my caseload for discipline. I'm responsible for all scheduling and scheduling changes. I coordinate the reading and math interventions. I'm the PBI's Tier 2 coach. I have two intervention groups that take place every other day for 42 minutes. I do all the bi-weekly PBIS lessons. I present weekly Trojan Target Awards on Wednesdays. I handle all the transition events from the elementary to the middle school and also work with the high school on eighth grade transition events as well as hold individual conferences for all the eighth grade students and their families. I do all the academic and career planning lessons. I send a weekly parent newsletter and I run the sources of the strength club. Take on more counseling would mean that I need to drop all of my groups, math team leader, and I'd have to eliminate the lessons that this person is currently doing and, the, and my ACP lessons and ask the teachers to take on that one if possible. I understand that the pupil service team would be reconfigured, but with minimal time in the middle school, at the most, that person would be taking on some counseling and maybe be able to help with some transition pieces. I'm reaching out to bring awareness to what this cut means for the middle school, but my hope is that you've explored how it would be impacted the high school as well. I wish I could be available to present this letter at the board meeting myself on Monday, but unfortunately I'm not available due to some needs with my family that evening. Please reach out with any questions or concerns. Respectfully, Krista Israelwolf, Dean of Students at the Middle School slash Counselor at the Middle School. Um, attention school board members and district administration. I was extremely disappointed to learn at last week's school board meeting that our administration has requested that you cut our elementary keyboarding program. I'm asking you to vote no to this cut and preserve a program that, was, that has a lifelong impact on our students. Keyboarding is an important skill that allows our students to com communicate more effectively and is critical to success in school, college, and careers in the 21st century. Students as early as the third grade are required to take a forward exam on a computer. Keyboarding mastery, keyboarding mastery is essential because without it, a student could risk underperforming on this exam and ask them to type both short answer questions and respond to a writing prompt. When a student knows how to type efficiently, they can focus energies on finding the right answers instead of thinking about where their right keys are. We will most certainly see a decline in these scores as students will lose this valuable skill. I have been teaching for almost 30 years and can personally attest to the fact that students who are not proficient in their keyboarding skills really struggle to keep up with the rest of the class. 
In addition, keyboarding is a basic skill people can leverage in their pursuit of other skills. A student who knows how to keyboard can learn other computer skills faster and with less effort. Successful companies recognize the importance of efficiency in the workplace. A competent keyboarder types quickly and accurately and is th therefore a more productive, valuable asset for a company. <coughs> Administration has stated that the responsibility to teach keyboarding will now fall on the classroom teachers. The board should be asking administration what that looks like. DPI recommends that a certified elementary keyboarding teacher teach the class for good reasons. There is definitely a method and art to teaching keyboarding. How will the district go about training these teachers to teach this skill? I was also told by administration that if down the road we pass a referendum, we could look at adding this, this position back. We all know that once a position is cut, it rarely comes back. I'm proposing that we keep this half-time position for at least one more year in hopes that we do pass a referendum. Given that this is a half-time position with no benefits and a minimal impact on the budget, I'm asking the board to take the money from the fund balance. The cost savings from cutting this position does not equal the lifelong impact that this will have on our students. I'm well aware that other districts have eliminated their elementary keyboarding programs. However, by voting to keep this valuable program, you will continue to make East Troy School District a district of choice. Thanks for your time and consideration. Sincerely, Debbie Lysing, Business Education and CTE Coordinator at the high school. That's all the letters I have. Um, if nobody else would like to speak on public participation, I'll move on to the financial report. I move the approval of January 2022 payments in the amount of $1,937,276.15 and receipts in the amount of $6,531,406.67 as reflected on the financial statements. Okay, any discussion or questions on the January report? trending at 41 okay. and we normally trend about 43 if you see that on page 10 right. yeah so about two percent ahead yes I just want to make sure we're yep around. and then we we still continue to be um, about two percent ahead in February as well okay. yep so yeah a good year for under expenditures again Correct, um, and then if you recall, we're doing middle school HVAC with projected positive variance this year as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments, or anything on the January report? I just question on the property taxes. Is that five million nine hundred sixty? Is that kind of in line with what you've seen previous years, or is it above, below? Yeah, overall, the so January and February are our biggest. They were a little bit lower, but we know how much we're going to receive in that. So if we get a little lower in January, February, we get more in August. Um, and you, yes, August, it's strange, but it's booked as a receivable back to June 30th. Um, it, the, eve, the late August taxes are still for this current school year. Um, but yes, overall, a little bit less compared to previous years, but that just means there'll be a greater shift into August because we're guaranteed the amount that we levy for in October. Um, so it's not something that you know might be lower and we might not get as much. So when we set the revenue limit formula, when we set the levy, 
then we know how much we're getting in property taxes. It's just how it's divided amongst the payments. Yeah, this is the time of year that we wait for, or that I wait for, to get out of the short-term borrowing funds that we need to get through November and December. November and December, we don't have enough of a fund balance, so we rely upon those bor borrowed funds that cost us interest to do, and then in January, we finally got a large amount of receipts in, same with February, that now gets us into positive um, as far as cash flow goes. So you say the fund balance is trending up, so you say you have to do short-term balancing against the fund balance November, December. Um, so does that mean that the fund balance is broke, or kind of explain that to me? No. It means that the, the greater the fund balance you have, the less you have to short-term borrow. So schools that don't have a very big fund balance have to borrow a lot of money. Um, off the top of my head, at some points in time, I've been here 12 years, there was about four million in borrowing we did. We're down to borrowing 1.5 million only. So again, when you pay interest on that borrowing, we're paying less to borrow money than if we had to borrow four million, for example. If we had to borrow zero, then we wouldn't have any interest costs on that borrowing. So again, the ideal situation for a school district is that you don't have to short-term borrow. You have a big enough fund balance that when you're not receiving receipts, which again from September, October, November, December, a school district doesn't receive much revenue during that time. So we are using in our cash flow previously built up revenues. And then in January, February, you get that money again. So it's just a cash flow timing okay. process. I got you. Mm -hmm. And that can be a little nerve-wracking, correct, Kath? I would think with uh, where interest rates may go. Yeah. Um, nerve-wracking nerve where inter interest rates may go. And then there was one time, again, uh, I've been a business manager for 18, 19 years now. It was about 15 years ago when we had a, a large recession and short-term borrowing was not being funded. So you would put bids out for short-term borrowing and the market was not giving anybody short-term borrowing. So luckily that rectified itself within a couple of weeks, but um, school districts at that time, it, and again, it all depends on when you receive certain aids, when you receive certain revenues. School districts are different, but you know, I can remember talking to my borrowing agent and they said, you know, two weeks ago, the school districts were doing bids not getting any so no one was lending money at that time for school districts and then again luckily it rectified itself but then you wouldn't meet payroll is what would happen because you don't have any money at the bank at that point so you know you'd have to tell your staff in November let's wait till January to pay you because we don't have the money in the bank and we have to wait for taxes to come in so short-term borrowing bridges that gap of not having funds at the bank. Okay. Any other questions on the January? All in favor of approval, of, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And we have the February. I move the approval of February 2022 payments in the amount of 1591000 Seven hundred eighty-two dollars and three cents, and receipts in the amount of five million eight hundred sixty-one thousand seven hundred forty-five dollars and seventy-seven cents, as reflected on the financial statements. I'll second. Any discussion? Questions? Kathy, can you look at page forty-three? Forty-three. Forty-three. Okay, I'm there. Um, about halfway down, there's um, revenue for CTE. Mm -hmm. I was trying to remember how, why we're getting revenue. Can you just yep. explain? That particular line item is um, the voice mini grants that people have applied for. Some of our wonderful teachers. Um, if I list them, I'm sure I'm going to forget someone, but 
there was a round early on in the fall and now a few more of those voice grants have gotten approved. Um, it's from Gateway, but again, our teachers are having to write and apply for those grants for things that they need in their classroom. So, and it's been in, again, the tech, the career and tech area because, again, it's uh, Gateway funded projects. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All in favor of approval of the February financial statement say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, discussion action items. First one is the student representative report. She's not here tonight. So we'll move on to the second item, staffing resignations. Yeah, we have a few, so I'll read them. Um, some may be in your packet and others may not be, so I will go through all of them. Uh, the first one is to the Board of Education of the East Trail Community School District. It is with a conflicted heart that I write this letter of resignation as the district's IMC director. It was my first teaching job at the East Troy, at the East Troy Middle School that brought me to this community working with the graduating class of 2006, each of whom will always be one of my kids. I have been a teacher, a librarian, a coach, an advisor, a committee member, a trustee, a colleague, and a community member. It is the last one that eases the con conflict in writing this letter. I have accepted the library director position with the East Troy Lions Public Library. The position will allow me to maintain my ties to both the district itself and the community at large while still providing my family with the health insurance lost following the reduction of the library position to 0.5 FTE. It is my intention to fulfill my current contract. However, as an employee of the public library, I may no longer serve as the school board's representative on the library board. Thank you for the opportunity to work with the East Troy students for the past 22 years. I hope to see you in the library. Sincerely, Tammy J. Bartoli. The next one, um, dear Dr. Himner and East Troy Community School Board, please accept this letter as my formal notice of my resignation for my position as the ninth through 12th grade social studies teacher at East Troy High School. My last day of work will be June 7th, 2022, at the end of the spring semester. I assure you that I've been working diligently to make sure that curriculum and materials are prepared for whomever may be taking my position next school year. I also give this letter of resignation now because I sincerely want to give the opportunity for the district to be able to hire a quality candidate this spring rather than perhaps settle for someone who may be still looking for a position later in the summer. Being a teacher at East Troy High School has been a great privilege. The staff and students are the best that I have ever had the pleasure of working with and it is bittersweet to say goodbye. The sole reason that I am resigning is because of the birth of a new child that I will be staying home with to provide child care for. My experience here has been overwhelmingly positive. Even with the pandemic, I count it my blessings daily to be part of such an amazing district with support of coworkers and positive students. I am saddened to leave East Troy behind, but excited to start this new chapter in my life. Sincerely, Brooke M. Philbrick. And the final one I have, Dear Dr. Hibner and the East Troy Community School Board, please accept this letter as notification of my resignation from my teaching position with the East Troy School District. After much reflection, I have determined I'm ready to start a new chapter in my life. Thank you to the administration, staff, teachers, students, and families for all of your support of the middle school band program. I've had the chance to work with an amazing team of teachers at the middle school and with some of the best music educators in the state. I appreciate all the hard work and dedication of all the band students over the years. I hope that band has helped them realize that they can achieve anything in life when they set goals high and have high expectations for themselves. Lastly, I wish for continued success of the music program in East Troy, as I know the importance that it has for the school district and the community. I wish you and the East Troy Community School District continued success. Sincerely, John Rash. All of these uh, we recommend approval for uh, with sincere gratitude and thank you to each one of them for the years of service and uh, uh, liquidated damages would be applied for those that are appropriate per contracts for each one. Okay. 
I'll make a motion to approve the resignations as presented. I'll second. Discussion? Okay. All in favor of approval, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Approval of donations. Uh, yeah, there's a few in your board packets. Uh, the first one is from AAT Inferred Incorporation out of Rockford. Uh, they have provided a generous donation of $200 to the East Troy, East Troy High School Wrestling Program. Uh, also, uh, the other one is for uh, from the East Troy Home Run Club. Uh, they have provided a generous donation of $1,200 to the baseball program. Uh, administration recommends approval with a sincere thank you to each one of them. I'll make a motion to approve the donations from the um, AAT Infrared to the high school wrestling program and from the East Trey Home Run Club for the baseball program. I'll second it. Okay. Discussion? Okay. All in favor of approval, say thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Motion carries. Uh, administration budget proposals programming for the 22-23 school year. Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, in your packet. Obviously, there's um, been a lot of discussion over this. Uh, some very well written, I think, comments tonight um, by staff members and the public. Um, and I think now is obviously uh, uh, it's for open session to have continued dialogue on the proposal. Uh, I think a couple things that are imperative uh, to kind of recall and remember, uh, and I encourage everybody to watch the last school board meeting too. I know that it's repetitive for those that continue to follow along, but understanding kind of the current status of the school district and unfortunately it's become a recurring theme in public education for the most part in many districts and that's a, a spring theme of having to balance budgets with uh, structural deficits um, and so it's resulted in a lot of school districts um, having to make difficult decisions around the state for some time and in a lot of districts um, having gone to referendums to be quite frank um, some stats that I think are important, you know, that Wisconsin Association of School Board puts out. So these are not my stats, they're your guys' stats from Wisconsin Association of School Boards uh, that represent all school boards throughout the state of Wisconsin. Um, a couple points that I thought are important to make about Wisconsin school funding. Uh, they have three bullet points that they've they recently put out. That Wisconsin ranked 49th in the nation in per pupil spending increase from 2011 to 2018 at 4.3% nationwide. The percent changed was 18.9%. Even after the significant reduction in school spending in 2011 and 13, total per pupil spending has continued to lag the rest of the country. Between uh, 2013 and 2018, Wisconsin spending increased by 11%, while nationwide the increase was close to 18%. Between 2008 in 2018, voters in 189 school districts have passed a total of 387 referenda to exceed revenue limits. Um, without that impact of these referenda, K-12 spending in Wisconsin would have actually been lower over the years as the previous stat demonstrated. Um, one of the things that they say that boards need to think about with the federal COVID relief funding, which we have had many had discussions and dialogue about, um, Federal COVID relief funds are one-time funds uh, intended to defray costs specifically related to the pandemic. It is neither advisable nor desirable to budget one-time funds for ongoing expenses. Uh, but at this point in time, I think this is not what they're saying, this is my commentary. At this point in time, I think school boards are absolutely having to strongly consider that due to the fact of mitigating, as we have, as everybody probably heard in previous board meetings, trying to discuss whether or not to mitigate the staffing impacts and the overall impacts to our school district. So you, looking at those funds, at this point in time, per the preliminary budget, um, our school board has considered that at this point in time, no action's been taken, but in the preliminary budget proposal that was put forth, $648,405 of the federal 
um, funds for COVID are being utilized in the preliminary, it could change right after discussion, more further discussion, but of that federal ESSER funding, uh, $648,405 is being utilized to help balance the budget. We still obviously have additional dollars, which is the difficult decisions of the other programming and staffing that we've been talking about. Um, but that is still $648,405, that's one-time funds. So that, that is an addition, uh, and we've said this all along, that's in addition to the projected $1.2 million deficit we have for next year. Not 2000, I mean the following budget after we balance this budget. So our projected 23-24 is a $1.2 million deficit even after we balance the 22-23 uh, budget. Then you would have to carry over the 648000 one-time federal funds unless the state biennial budget, at the next biennial budget, they elect to obviously do something with the per pupil to help cover some of those costs of the one-time federal funds in addition to maybe the inflationary costs too. Uh, and as we know, I think the difficult thing for the school boards, not just ours around the state, when you're talking about a biennial budget, is they're often not decided upon during even the summer months, more or less the fall. So they get decided upon oftentimes in the fall. Um, so you're making decisions with pure assumptions and projections, um, which is very difficult. I've asked for that to get better aligned for a long time. <laughs> um, so I think, I think that's, that's some of the difficulties. And I think we all would agree. I mean, I shouldn't jump to an assumption, but, but I, I will, and that is, Predictability is a nice thing to have when you're doing a budget. I mean, budgets are not actuals, right? They're budgets, they become actuals. Uh, but predictability is a good thing to have, and the less predictability on, on numbers, the more difficult it becomes, right? And I think the difficult part is that what our board and other boards want is, is to have sustainability and to have sustainability and stability from the aspect of that your operations, the people within it, the staff, the students, and the families that are a part of it, that they feel that there's operational sustainability. And to do so means you need to have some predictability, right? Uh, or else if you don't, I oftentimes say, what you have in, in general is chaos. Um, and, and why do you have chaos? Because you have uncertainty. You just have uncertainty. And when you have uncertainty, it makes families nervous, it makes staff nervous, and, and those because they're not sure of what is to come. And so I think those, those are some of the difficult things on that predictability standpoint. And then obviously, as everyone knows, we have the inflationary increases occurring. Right? And so we have a large scale of inflationary increases. So I think those things all add to lack of uh, predictability also and difficulties and projections. Uh, so as the superintendent of schools, I just wanna say every, every person that spoke tonight in regards to the staffing, um, I just wish we didn't even have to even do this or think about it. Um, I have no problem saying that out loud, and I know some people would probably disagree with me. Um, because I truly believe that every position in our district is needed, and valued, and important. And, and each and every year, we look at positions. We look at efficiency and effectiveness. Um, but I think, you know, everybody has a lot of responsibilities, and and I think one aspect that we need to constantly remember in our educational system is we, are, we have a responsibility to the obligation of all kids. All kids. That's very large. It's a large encompassing when you're talking about all kids. And, and you've heard me say it before, I know the board, I'm not speaking to the board when I say this, I'm really speaking to the public. And that is, you know, we have six district goals and I would like to believe that 
I'm very held, I'm held very much responsible for the accountability of these six district, district goals. But, and I, I believe in them wholeheartedly. I've been a part of helping to make these become a reality. Matter of fact, I've been a part of making these goals. But when we say ensuring a year to a year plus of learning growth for each child each year, ensuring programming opportunities through systems and practices that develop the talents of each child in an era of globalization, ensuring individualized learning by empowering students with a personalized learning environment, employing the highest quality professional staff. Staff. Doesn't say administration, supervisors, teachers, staff. That's a lot of individuals. Adapting facilities, adapting facilities for current and future educational needs. And demonstrating fiscal responsibility through efficiency and effectiveness. Now, people could debate all six of those, I guess. But my, my hope, I'm, what I'm really proud of is five of those six are strongly about student-centered and quality staff. And the fiscal responsibility, by all means, is just as important as the other five that are about students and staff. Because we need to demonstrate fiscal responsibility as we know it's, it's an impact to the community. But with that being said, I think we have to ask an honest question. It doesn't have to be answered tonight. But how are we going about ensuring those and, and looking at any individual? If I look at this gentleman right here tonight as a parent, you know, talking to him and saying, he has every right to say, how are you doing that when, you're, when you've made in the last uh, 16 years, if this were to go through tonight or in the future agendas, this additional 1.1 million deficit that we're projecting for next year, which now then comes to a compounding 9.1 million in the last 16 years, um, not including our impact needs that we've done. I, I think people have a right to say, how are you going to achieve those goals? Now, it's not to say we're just not achieving or we're falling over. I mean, we take great pride in those goals. I don't think those goals should ever go away. But I do think, again, we have to think about how we're achieving those goals when we constantly are maybe having to talk to less, when we're constantly maybe having to reduce our staff. Or as we've talked about long and hard, this year we've decided that we're going to provide that salary increase to CPI possibly. That's been a proposal in the budget, right? And that we said we don't want to do it on the backs of our employees on salaries or benefits this year, even with the benefit increase. And so we're saying, look, we, we're trying to avoid that to stay not only competitive with our surrounding districts, because we know that it's a com more competitive market now than ever before. And we also know that more and more, less people talk to the university systems are less in education now than ever before. But we, so we know we need to stay competitive on numerous fronts. But um, I think, you know, in a time in which we're, we're trying to say, we want to be district of choice. We want to be the best. I had this discussion with a person I respect greatly, um, and we had a discussion about you know the district and everything. And I said I, I think one of the things that we have to talk about ultimately is you know we do need to improve on certain things. But I said I go, but we always do. We always need to be focused on that. But I said the realities are. If we're, we also have to show people that are having their kids come to our system that we're investing in the system, that we're investing in the system. Because I said, whenever I'm questioned about surrounding districts and I'm getting, and I'll say it, I am getting grilled about comparisons, I also oftentimes will say, can we do a full comparison? A full comparison? I mean, you can't just pick out pieces of the comparison then. Then let's look at, that district that you're bringing up, do they have an operational referendum? How long have they had an operational referendum? What's the amount of that operational referendum? When did they pass that operational referendum? Did they do maintenance referendums, capital projects? When did they pass those capital projects? You know, I, those are really important. I will say one of the things I lost sleepless nights over a lot lately, and I know I'm rambling, but I'm going to, and that is the historical interest, low interest rates we had last April, and the historically low construction costs we had last April. And so when, when we say on that sixth bullet point, demonstrating fiscal responsibility, 
demonstrating fiscal responsibility is taking advantage of historically low interest rates and historically low construction costs. That's phenomenal timing. And so if we don't do that, which we didn't, and now we have interest rates here and we have construction costs here, it, it, it's hard when I get a call and I'm being asked to deal with the, this shortfall. I literally am. And it's not just me, it's our district, but the person's talking to me maybe. And then they're asking me to do these other things. And I'm going, look, last April the board Made, or last January, the board made a decision to go to referendum in April. It didn't pass. It was close on the or close on the maintenance and a little, far, little, little farther away on the uh, operational, but that was asked. It did not pass. So then we have to, we can't act as if it was. It didn't pass. But I, I do oftentimes say to somebody who then is saying, you need to be financially more responsible. I want to reverse the question and say, well, how wasn't that responsible last April? And how is it responsible now? Unless, unless I'm speaking to an individual who is basically saying never go to referendum. And that's fine if you have that opinion. But I do want to ask then if that's the thought process, how do we resolve this? Now, we can resolve it by continuing to cut and, and make it less. We can operate it with a one classroom one building, schoolhouse, ultimately, sooner or later. I mean, you can do that, right? I've heard other districts talk that way. We are in a competitive market. We've all talked about that. We've all talked about that. I have people who have some strong opinions that might not align to mine who talk about they want to reverse the open enrollment still. I couldn't agree more with that. How do we reverse the open enrollment if the districts we might be losing them to are adding programming, passing referendums, adding to their capital, don't have huge maintenance things because of that, and, w and we are having this dialogue tonight. How is that attractive? Now, I know that's all scary, and I've been accused of, Chris, your reality scares people. <laughs> I've, I've actually been accused of that. I will tell you I'm the most optimistic person you will ever meet. But I also, it's real. It's, it's real. It's reality. So I, I can't paint a picture of total optimism when we're dealing with this and then people want me to not deal with that. Like, it's, it's all, you know, solve the open enrollment, Dr. Hibner. But we don't want to do this, 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 or this. You're limiting how we can solve maybe the open enrollment. Right? You're limiting it. I'm not saying it's impossible. You're limiting it. You know, you know we're going to do a survey with our middle school and high school kids. We want to find out their career pathways that they're really interested in. We said, forget all the adults for a minute, in all due respect. We said, let's talk to the kids and ask them what their careers they're interested in, their careers. And let's find out whether or not do we have the pathways for those careers right now. Do we? If we don't have a pathway that a lot of kids are interested in, we need to create that pathway. We need to create it. Now, here's the question. What happens if we start finding out that a lot of the pathways are not the ones we have, that we need to create because those kids are wanting that, they're needing that, and we're gonna have to create that, maybe with upgrading of a facility or just staffing, whatever. The question will be, are we going to? Right? The, I mean, what happens if our open enrollment kids tell us that? If we can identify 25 of our open enrollment kids that say, do the medical, do this huge medical field, and you'll get me to come back. Well, we just kind of resolve some of our open enrollment. Not all of it, but some of it. Can we do that? It becomes a little more difficult when we're doing this. I was just at a school district this weekend, and I took a picture of there signed because they're going to a fairly decent referendum in April. And it was, they're already a very solid school district, I'd like to say, on solid ground from a budgetary standpoint and growth. And they're at, their referendum is about adding additional things to their high school about the medical field and about the tech ed field and all that. 
because they have found that that's where their students are more interested in and they need to expand on what they're already providing. And they have quite a wealth of programming already. I, those are, I didn't think like, oh, what I thought was, that's our competition. It's our competition. Like that's, that's what we're competing. We gotta keep thinking about that. We just have to keep thinking that way, right? How are we excelling in that way? So, sorry for going on. I'm not a pessimist, I'm an optimist. But I'm, what I'm trying to do is state the realities of, I guess I will say it, this is probably gonna be in trouble, I don't care. Um, I'm here to help balance a budget. I'm here for kids and being an advocate. I became an educator to, be, to help kids. I became a teacher, I became a principal, I became a superintendent to first and foremost help kids. Numbers are important, budgets are important. They're not more important than the kids. So I just, you know, I hope everybody gets that when this board, like Alexa, make those decisions about saying we need assistance and help. That's, that's what it comes down to when they're doing it. So with that being said, you have things in front of you. Um, please ask us questions. We have the necessary personnel here tonight to probably be able to explain or to provide information on that. Um, in regards to if you have questions of the impact or what it will look like. And um, like I said, I wish, and I know the board would echo this, I wish we didn't even have to have these discussions. I wish we could just throw it to the side. I guess that's an option. The only problem with that is we still have to balance our budget. So if we throw it to the side, it's are we gonna use even more ESSER funds, which we don't have that many more dollars after we utilize these, we have some. Or are we going to utilize the fund balance? And we heard already, Kath wasn't bringing that up for that reason, but there's a consequence to that if we use the fund balance. And the realities are, I would tell you, I'm okay with using some of those or all those methods if I thought we could replenish our funds. But if we can't replenish our funds, then we're using dollars for ongoing cliff item expenses. And then if, they, if we don't get additional assistance to support that, we used a lot of dollars for ongoing cliff items and we're gonna be in the same discussion a year from now, but it's actually even gonna be larger. It'll be larger. So that, that's, the, um, that's the issue um, with that being said. <coughs> so if you have any questions in regards to the budget, please ask or, or sign up or some of the uh, narrative I just provided. Thank you. I'd like to revisit the um, the middle school counselor position. Um, I've heard from many community members, both here publicly and um, online, that they are concerned about our performance at the middle school. And I know I, I should preface all of this by saying we don't want to make any of I don't want to make any of these cuts. Right? All all, all of these positions are important in their own ways. Um, and, and add to the, the pie that we're creating, right? It's all a collective effort. Um, so uh, I guess know that from me. Um, but knowing that we've, we've suggest, suggested some impact needs and additions to the middle school, I believe with the intention of directly um, influencing, addressing some concerns there. I'd like us to revisit the, the counselor position um, to see what we can do about retaining that. Um, I agree with that. Could we kind of get an explanation of how administration envisions that moving forward if that position is eliminated? I know we had an impact need, or not an impact need, but a write-up on it, but just kind of describe it again. So we don't have anything like set in stone exactly, but it would be that the um, secondary school counseling department, if you will, would 
be redistributed. So, so sixth that grade through 12th grade, just to be what? clear. Sixth grade through 12th grade, you're saying? Yeah, so right clear. now there's four staff members who have some level of school counseling, right? So we've got the school counselor slash dean at the middle school, we have the full-time school counselor at the middle school, and we have two full-time counselors at the high school. So with one of those positions being cut, then it would be um, really three people dividing out the duties across both the middle school and high school. So there would be some shared support um, across buildings because of that. So whether that means that um, you know, one person is doing, say, sixth and seventh grade, and one person doing eighth and ninth, and some of that transition, or if we, there would be shared support across the buildings, is um, what we would have to do. If this board said to administration, okay, we want to keep this what would your recommendations be to fund it, if any? Without going into the whole list of ideas we had prior that mm -hmm. we narrowed down, um, the difficult part about that is we're at a point in time, we really do believe, I mean, I think you look at our past histories of where we had been and where we are, uh, there's not a lot of where you say, well, that, that's a much easier decision. If, if there was, we would have brought that forward, to be right. honest. Um, if I think the, I would, I don't want to speak out of turn, because if you want to direct us to do that, by all means, we'll go back to the drawing board as an administration group. But let me just state what, what some of the things that, without going too far and making everybody be in a concern over what's being discussed at our administrative level, uh, but some of the things would be, right? I mean, we know that we always look at well, are we discussing a programming issue then? Are we looking at a programming, which the board in the past years has said, right? I mean, we know that we can't avoid that. Look, we already had to address world language the other year, right, with French. But we tried to avoid programming as much as possible because we recognize that's certain groups of kids that we're affecting, right, and that they may leave our district if we're affecting programming. But we've had to have discussions on programming now much more frequently than we've had in the past. We this. We definitely discussed, as you guys all know, uh, we discussed uh, a lot at, in depth about class sizes going into this year. And we said, look, um, if, if not for this, then what about this? If we don't do this, then what about that? And we started going, to be frank, if we go down a section here, uh, what does that do for a class size? Wow, 23 to 31, or right? We had those dialogues and discussions due to the fact we were trying to recognize what are all the choices. So to answer your question, Ted, we, if the board directs us, we by all means we go back for further dialogue and discussion over it. It's just I don't know if we're going to unfold anything that's going to make you feel comfortable no matter what we bring forth besides the discussion of we don't want staff to be impacted, which impacts kids, so we don't want you to touch programming. We don't really want to touch class sizes. Um, and we don't, we recognize the need for pupil services and administration, and you've already gone down one administrator by not replacing them for the next year's budget. Uh, so we're gonna look at fund balance, or we're gonna look at more ESSER funds uh, to be used out of the one time uh, to cover that cost. Uh, those would be things that all could be considered by the board uh, with the thought of, we just have to think about, so what does that mean going forward, as we all know, right? For the next year, right? I mean. No, I, I do, not, do not take this the wrong way, right? I don't believe anybody here kicks the can down the road. I think it is about just we really believe we want to maintain what we have then, right, maybe, or something. Well, to do so, um, we'd have to resolve how we're going to, where we're going in the future with the additional dollars we're adding to the deficits the next year. So, so I mean, I'll say it. There's nothing to cut. There's nothing to cut. It's, it's all been cut. I mean, I'm the newest one here with Dale there's nothing to cut there just isn't you know we can't we can't be upset about outcomes if we don't want to pay for anything so I, I I don't know I don't know any other way to say it I was going to prepare a whole statement tonight and you know David said nobody wants to hear your lecture it, that'll probably come at a later time there's nothing left to cut it 
we, we're, we're cheating ourselves. No, you're cheating the kids. We're you're cheating the kids. You're that, cheating the kids. Education. That's who's getting screwed over. Sir, just let Make the, the right decision. Let the board discuss. Sorry. I, that's okay. I mean, the next words out of my mouth were, we're, we're, we're cheating our kids, right? I mean, I have three kids in the district. I'm, I'm, I grew up here, my family's from here. I'm sad to see that this is what we're talking about at this point. I'm incredibly impressed by a counselor who had a one-year contract. I mean, thank you. That was an incredible list of accomplishments in a year. Not even a year, how many months have we been in school? I mean, we, we as a community should be saying thank you at every turn. These folks are our neighbors, they are taking care of our children, they're preparing all of us for what we, we have in our future. If we're not willing to invest locally where we have the most influence, I, I mean, I just, I can't, that's the stuff that I think about, like, how do I make sense of that, right? I don't wanna send my money way far away, I'd like to keep it close by. I mean, we, none, of, none of these cuts are fair, are appropriate, are building toward anything that folks are asking us to do. Yeah, like Dr. Hibner said, our, our competition out there right now, some of it is having the opposite conversation that we're having tonight. They're sitting there thinking about all the great things they can do, the things they can add to their, their children's education experience. And this is my fourth year doing this. And honestly, it feels like that movie Groundhog Day where it just keeps going back to the same thing every time. It, you know, I, I think our community deserves to see that other side someday. I really, really hope we can get there someday because, I mean, like Anna said, we're getting down to the nitty gritty here. I remember four years ago sitting here saying there's the slippery slope sitting in front of us. And that was when we were going, going to try to pass that first referendum. And I said, once we start going down that thing, it's hard to get a grip. It's hard to catch on to something and stop it. And after the second failed referendum, we're well down that slide now. And I mean, we're just sitting here. I mean, right now, some people might not think these are big deals, these cuts. Without those ESSER funds, Believe me, you'd be feeling it. You'd be talking class sizes, all those things that a lot of people really care about. And that's a one-time thing. That won't be here next year. I don't know how we'd be able to, to keep it. That's going to be even harder and worse. Um, I just, I mean, as far as this uh, the counselor position, I mean, in a time when mental health slowly gaining some understanding and some importance, um, I mean, these kids need a safe place to go, and more importantly, a safe person to talk to. And uh, I just hope we can find a way to still fill those needs. I don't know how many hats other people can keep wearing and throwing on, because eventually you wear so many hats, you're going to break. You just can't keep doing that. Well, and if we want our teachers focused on teaching, then we need the other services supported. I mean, if we want to be focused on teaching and learning as well as social support, I'm not, I'm not discounting all, any of the other things, but when you add all that to one person's plate, they don't have as much uh, ability to do all of the things as well as you want them to do. There's just only so much time in a week. So I, I, can I jump in here? Yeah. So one of the premises that the board has always operated under is a balanced budget. That we go into the next school year, that we have expenses equal revenues. I'm just gonna ask this question, are we talking about not doing that? Are we talking about not balancing a budget? I don't know if that's the question. I think the other, well, more important or relevant question would be, do we roll the dice, essentially, something I've never done in my life. I'm not a gambling person, don't ever want to be. 
But essentially, that's what we'd be doing is rolling the dice to use the remaining ESSER funds or going to fund balance to try to bring back a couple of these positions. That's essentially what we'd be doing. And I don't know what the rest of the board feels about doing that, but it's a scary thought to me. Well, that's why I brought it up before, because I think we're trending positively. And I, I, I want to talk about the keyboarding position, too. I had that noted before. I mean, it's, it's not a huge impact. The middle school council, we don't often get these many people speaking about specific things um, that they don't want to see cut. And again, none of these things we want to cut until the community starts coming to us and asking us to pass a referendum. That's what we need. It shouldn't be a board decision. It should be a community decision asking us to do it. But I would rather see us use fund balance for both of those, the middle school counselor and the keyboarding position, since we're trending so positively for the year. And we'll still be able to add to fund balance, maybe not quite as much, um, Maybe it's only a half a million that we're able to add to fund balance to reduce our um, need to borrow with the increase in inflation. I mean, we've been lucky because the amount of interest we've paid the past few years for borrowing is not enough to talk about. That's changing. Yeah. That will change drastically for next year. So um, that's my feeling on it. What was the percent, what, how much was to be set aside out of this year's um, variance for the middle school? Uh, a little over 400000 for the middle school HVAC. Okay. Did we already go into fund balance to keep these class sizes? Uh, no. Down? no. 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 Nope. So this year's positive variance, which again happens when we're running better than projected, um, was for middle school HVAC so far. Um, then note the piece that we build into the budget every year is to end 120,000 better in revenues than expenditures so that we can do a four-year Chromebook replacement cycle. So just, again, know that when we close the books on June 30th, at a minimum, we want to end $120,000 better in the black because then we build up over four years the amount we need every four years to do a Chromebook replacement cycle, and that's coming next budget. So when we approve next year's budget, we already were gonna see a $400,000 gap because of next year's the time to do the Chromebook replacement cycle. And again, we were planning on booking positive variance this year. The timing of the middle school HVAC, those bills likely will not be paid out by June 30th. So you're gonna be booking positive variance again to pay for middle school HVAC in the next cycle of, because we run on a July 1st through June 30th cycle. But again, so far we were not, um, we were not, we were doing this premise on not of this budget, you know, going into fund balance. You do still has, have, as Ted pointed out, some ESSER dollars. We have 460,000 ESSER reserved. We were going to use 328,000 on this budget. So you have roughly another 130,000 that, again, we could quote unquote save these positions with. Um, I'll tell you when you look out at projections, again, Dr. Hibner mentioned we have the third year of declining enrollment, we lost 100 kids. The way the formula works, it's on a per pupil basis how much funding you get. So when you have less kids in the district, you're going to have less funding that you can utilize for all of your costs, for all of your expenses. And we have one more bad year because there's a three-year rolling average that all that enrollment gets calculated on. A lot of business managers are saying try to get to 2425 with your ESSER dollars because if you use them all this year, the 2223, which we're talking about, then you have created a fiscal cliff, which we've been talking about that, and we will need to go to referendum next year. Like for the 2324 school year, we would need to be going to referendum. The problem, it's not insurmountable, 
But the problem is, by the time we have to set the question for the referendum, you're not gonna know what the next biennial budget is from the state. You're not gonna know how much money possibly we're getting. So as Chris mentioned again, it's a shot in the dark. It's, I, it's probably not gonna be enough to fund the fiscal cliff, but a lot of times people don't believe that. They believe some, again, magic's gonna happen that is gonna fund us so you don't need a referendum. So then they may vote no for the referendum. Again, business managers are saying if you can at least wait it out till 2425 to go to referendum, you will know what the state gave us in the biennial budget. You will know if they gave us zero again like they did this year. You will know if they replenished $400 per pupil to make up for lost ESSER funds. You will know if they gave just the standard 200 per pupil. So you can ask for a little better dollars going into your referendum. You can ask for a number that is more representative of what you know the school district needs. Otherwise, it's not even looking at a crystal ball. Again, I've said many times, the crystal ball has fallen off the shelf and broken. There is no crystal ball anymore. I don't know what's gonna happen. No one does, okay? So we would be using up all our remaining us or dollars essentially if we main if we keep those positions we'd be using them all all our ESSER dollars up in this cycle in 22-23 we have one choice which is reduce fund balance to get us to 24-25 besides going to referendum so if you reduce fund balance let's say you reduce it by the 1.8 1.9 million that you would not be cutting from the budget. That's another 1.8, 1.9 million that you have to borrow and pay interest on. Again, not insurmountable, insurmountable can be done. Is it best financial practice? Absolutely not. Okay, so that's, you know, again, a rundown here of what we're facing. So the original idea that we had discussed many times is try to reserve some ESSER dollars to be in 23-24. So the more things that we do not cut now, then you don't have ESSER dollars for 23-24. That's basically what it is. The ESSER dollars you can use until September 30th of 2024. Again, do I wish I would have an idea what the state would be thinking about restoring funding? Are they gonna say, you have ESSER dollars till 2024, too bad on you that you spent them all in year one, you were supposed to save them for all of the years, or are they gonna start replenishing in the next biennial budget? Again, no ideas, no, that depends upon the people again at the state level and what are they gonna do. And one of the things in your board packets, which we'll get to later, but it's on the agenda, right, is um, school funding support letter to legislators and to the governor uh, in regards to, right, so the Senate Assembly and to the governor in regards to proper funding that a lot of school districts are saying and businesses even are saying they're signing and sending because of the surplus, the 5.5 billion. And they're saying, can't you, they've acknowledged saying, can't you utilize 700 million of that which will help to offset some of the inflationary costs. And they're, they're saying, why aren't we utilizing some of that? And they've already done the estimates with it. So that's one of the things we were gonna to discuss tonight. Again, not helping us right now at the given moment in time. One of the other things I wanna bring up is because Kathy said about that crystal ball. If people recall last year, I mean, I wish we could tell you precisely, right? But I think we've demonstrated tonight why we can't, right? With assumptions and the state budget. But I mean, when we went to referendum, we were projecting an $800,000 deficit for 22-23, right? I mean, look, we're, we're going at 1.1 million or greater, okay? And that's just a structural deficit besides our impact needs. So the, why is that? Because we're projecting a $200 per pupil revenue that we've gotten. We weren't projecting a zero dollar per pupil. And, and I'm gonna be honest here, the rationale on that is, we had that discussion. We said, whams, if there's a zero, a 200, a 250, 
right? We had those discussions up here all along, a year plus, a year and a half, two years ago. One of the big things is we said we, we're not going to project a zero because then people are going to think we're asking for more than we need, and it's going to impact their tax impact. So we said we want to be reasonable based upon historical perspective. That's the reason we did it. Well, the zero came to fruition. So even with the referendum last year for the operational of the past, we'd still be here looking at additional cuts we, because we would not have had the additional monies. And that was one of the things that some people were holding us to, like, you're going to promise us that this is going to cover. We can't. We, didn't, we don't know what the state budget was going to do, and we'll be in that same position again. And, and we have to honestly be, take a step back and go, are you an individual who thought we were asking for too much? And if we would have done zero, you would have said, forget it. They, zero. There's no historical data that says it's going to be zero at the state level. And now they're asking for that. And I don't believe they're going to, I don't believe they're going to use what they're going to need. I believe they're going to use it all. And we were saying we're going to use what we need. But the realities are we would have needed all 800 and then some because the zero came to fruition. Those are the difficult things that administration and this board are having to deal with that there is no crystal ball to. And that's the difficult part in general when, when you're dealing even with any type of referendum question. We elected to try and do the minimal tax impact. So I see it as you can um, go, utilize more ESSER if you want. Again, that just means there's less available for the next year. Um, but you're already using quite a bit, okay? Um, you can purposely pull from fund balance. That's fine, too. Again, not ideal, but you can. Um, you could cut something else. You, you know, in the cut something else, it could be some other position that goes. It could be that some of these salaries or benefits, that was another one of our, we were going into this budget, Dr. Hibner um, referenced it with some of these premises. I'll reread them. And it comes from, again, many meetings that we've had. So we're gonna balance the budget. We're not gonna operate in the red, but maybe we, Abandon that one. Um, we said some positions needed to be added for district action plans toward addressing district learning with a heavy, heavy emphasis on the middle school and their test scores. That's another way maybe. We don't add those positions. Um, they're up in those impact needs at the top of that page. Um, we have balanced prior year's budgets on the backs of employees with minimal to no wage increases, mimicking revenues from the state in the past years. We've had large scale benefit changes that have netted zero dollar to decreased take home wages. Our comparable wage and benefit packages cannot decline further was one of our premises and have us continue to attract and retain high quality employees, which is one of our district goals. Um, even though there is still one line item of stipend reductions that will affect some employees, being very transparent with that. So maybe we take away from there and keep positions. This goes back to that, if you recall, again, we've, the board has been through many meetings. You can look back on the history and see the closed sessions where a lot is deliberated, a lot of personnel. So that's why, again, it's in closed session. Um, but that goes back to that list of, again, these premises, these goals, what do we want? There's a lot of ways to slice a budget and balance a budget, but it's about philosophy. Utilize ESSER, even though there's a fiscal cliff to avoid massive position layoffs and our salary and benefit reduction this year, but this creates other challenges. Tony said it, if we didn't have ESSER dollars this year, you know, we would be on the second year here of trying to balance after a failed referendum and we had the postcard that said here would be all the cuts. The only reason why those cuts are not happening again is because we have these outside federal dollars. Um, and I've never seen that before, again, doing this 20 years that the feds came in. Now, Dr. Hibner said those were supposed to be COVID-related federal fund usage. Um, but our state said, nope, we're going to give you zero per pupil and use that to balance your budgets. 
Um, and then the last but not least premise was we were going to conduct some position reductions to not make the fiscal cliff even larger for future years. But again, we could abandon that. And I showed that picture of a cliff of Dover or something. Really, again, what I picture is just are those cliffs getting taller well, because we're using more ESSER dollars and we theoretically will not have them um, in years to come. Okay, so that was the last premise that we had on our budget balancing cycle this year. I mean, if the board wants, and you know, it would be absolutely uh, direction by the entire board, uh, if you want, I mean, we, we have time on our side, not a ton, because we have some timelines we have to meet, right? If we elect to go forward with some staffing, there's timelines that uh, we're required to meet, but we still have a little time on our side for that, so. If you just want to, after more dialogue tonight, if you want to direct and say, we're just, there's no motion on the table for this tonight, but we're, we're directing administration, you know, can you guys just go back again? I, I hope you know we've spent plenty of time on it. It's not that we didn't, right? I mean, we've gone through, we, we only bring forth the things that we really think can be strongly considered. Uh, but if you want to direct that, I, I don't want you thinking it has to be done tonight. It does not. It has to be done soon, right? And could we do it between now and the next board meeting for a special meeting, if you like? Yes. To have another dialogue? Or could we wait to the next regular board meeting, the first one in April, because we have two? Yes. We could do that. Uh, I would say we can't go beyond the first one, the first board meeting in April, right? Decisions would have, would have to be made uh, due to the fact of the relation to personnel or not personnel and those type of things moving forward. Uh, but. But by all means, those things can be can be discussed. Um, you know, some I know all of you realize we did a, a survey with our entire staff, and we had a great response. And I just wanted to share a couple of things because I think these are important statistics to know of this survey. Um, I won't share it all; it's a long. But here's a couple of things. Uh, all respondents, this is the percentage. I'm not going to break it down per building, per departments. Right? We could do that later if we want. But I am able to maintain a healthy work-life balance. 59% of our staff say they're able to, 59.86% say they're able to maintain a healthy work-life balance. That's concerning to me right now. And that's a pretty low number, really. I don't look at that and go, wow, that's great. I look at it and say, that's a pretty low number right now, percentage. I'd love to know what that was like two years ago, three years ago, if we had that. I believe my pay is fair for the work I do, 38.03%. Um, I believe the benefits I receive are fair compared to others of this profession, 61.97%. And one of the biggest ones I think that we just need to make sure we're always having a pulse on, I've considered searching for a different job in the past few months in another school district, not in another profession. That's a different question uh, because we have found that out. But I have considered searching for a different job in, in the past few months in another school district, 57.04% of our staff has said that they have considered that in the past few months. Um, and I'm going back to the other ones I read before because by I just want to say most it, it's fairly high about how they feel about working in public education, how they feel about their work and a purpose, how they feel about district goals and all those things. Those are pretty high. Those are pretty high. Like they're pretty happy about all that stuff. So when people want to talk about culture and climate, I, I would say I don't I think this tells you it's not the culture climate issue that's not really the big part there's other things going on um, about it so I just think that's important you know again I go back to that word sustainability and providing stability to them to our staff right um, and um, you know and, and I'll, I'm gonna just say it you know we've discussed the middle school counselor and eliminating prairie view and I, I, in keyboarding, in eliminating prairie view. Sorry, Mark, that probably made you go, whoa. <laughs> eliminating prairie view keyboarding. Um, there are other things on here, right, that I don't want anybody to just dismiss and say, well, they haven't been discussed, so they're irrelevant. I'm not saying you guys feel that way at all as the board. Please, you know, I'm just saying, and I'm not saying you should say, go revisit it all. Like, what have we been doing, <laughs> right? I get we can't do that. Um, I would tell you we've, we've recommended to being down the administrator, we're gonna have to make that work. But I, I am saying 
None of these things, right? Being down an administrator, being down the elementary school math interventionist, that's, that's going to be a reconfiguration over into the middle school, but it's going to affect the elementary school. The elementary school, you know, it's what we said a, a couple weeks ago, and that is pretty much every reduction comes back to be an impact need sooner or later again. It just does. It's like playing with a puzzle, and I like puzzles, but all we're doing is shifting the problem around. We gotta fill the whole puzzle in, man. We gotta fill the puzzle in. Instead, we're missing pieces, and we're just all we're doing is shifting. Every if we're gonna reconfigure, like things from the elementary school to go over to the middle school, right? Because we're recognizing certain things that we want to provide there that haven't been provided, and no discredit to the middle school, we haven't provided them as a district. We've been providing them more at the high school and elementary levels. If you look at our historical perspective, more staffing has been provided in recommendations the last decade over to those two buildings. So if, when we look at that, the, um, but the problem is, as soon as you start then saying, well, at the expense of the high school and elementary school, what's gonna happen in those buildings? What's just gonna happen in those buildings? We'll be back four or five years talking about what we need for staffing in those buildings. Because they're gonna have lost programming or test scores will have gone down or, right? Or they're gonna have massive turnover. It's just, it's a cycle. It's a cycle, so we've gotta, we gotta think about those things, right? Right now, we're trying to resolve what we can. Um, you know, and Tony, you, you stated this, I'm just gonna say it, um, all of you have in indirect ways, and that is, you know, going back to like referendums, whether it be capital or operational, another thing that's difficult for people to comprehend a little, and, and that is the gap gets harder to catch up or to stay with or to go above if people are passing those and we're not, right? So like I was explaining a couple weeks ago at, at our board meeting, after the board meeting was done, I had a really discussion, a good discussion after our board meeting with somebody. And, but I was explaining that gap is tougher when you're, let's say you're taking on a district that we're trying to compete against and we're talking about, let's say, an open enrollment issue and I'll just leave it at that. But then if you look and you're like, well, that district for, you know, has had two successful, let's say, operate, I'm just using this example, two successful operational referendums in 10 years, let's say, and they have a five year and a five year. Do you know much more that put them ahead possibly than us, not only on the maintaining, but whams if they use that to, to maintain and increase their programming. And whams if that increasing their programming resulted in some kids going, well, you don't have that program, but they do. So now they, they attract the kids from other districts, not only ours, but others. Now they're paying for that program through the other districts. The other districts are paying for that program. And now they're just on a, they're, they're going. That district's moving. They are forward moving. So when people are like, get forward moving like those other districts, I go, it's really hard to catch up because they've been way ahead for 10 years, 15 years, because they've been passing. They've been passing. So my point is, would we be thrilled with a passage? I'm going to be honest. If, if, if the community come together and figure out what it is that's really needed and that's the point, yes. But I'm going to be blunt. It doesn't make up for the other years. It just doesn't. It doesn't magically just make you in a, in a secure spot because they've been doing it for how many other years already? That's the, the tough mode. And the person I was talking to at the for me, it was a good discussion. I could see the wheels were turning and, and it was great. It was a good discussion. Like that's, you know, I could honestly feel like they were looking at me like that's a really good point. Um, you know, that's, it just doesn't flip. So I just, I just want to bring up all the other spots, you know. They're all important, as Anna said. There's nothing. There's nothing where you're like, that's a simple one. Well, it would have been like 17 more positions if we didn't have ESSER money. I mean, and that's a conservative yes. number. I don't, I don't even know how many. You're right. What the, right. What the right number is, 20? And I see Andy Daniels back there. He's our building and grounds. Andy's probably hearts going 100 miles an hour now that I just said that. Andy will be the first one to tell you he said it on his impact needs when he presented to the board, uh, was that last time, that really he could use another full-time custodian if you go by just square footage alone. Square footage alone in the average, it's not just his method. If you look at square footage alone and the comparison of it, it, based on the recommendation of coverage, 
it means we really should have a, another full-time custodian. We shouldn't be going down one, we should be hiring one. If you use that, if you use that information. But yet he had to bring forth, because we asked, we said we, we need to look at everything. He had to bring forth a recommendation on here of going down one, not up, not going up one. That's another impact. That'll be an impact of facility use, of cleaning, right? Reed Oldenburg going from a supervision to another supervision, but maybe having to go into helping Ms. Keene because she'll be the sole principal up here in regards to like, taking over some dean responsibilities. There's no way that doesn't impact facility usage. I mean, we finally got a full-time athletic director slash facility coordinator, right, a few years ago. Well, we don't have that anymore based upon this budget. And I, I, I know I'm sounding like just, but it's about understanding that there's impacts to everything, right? And I know people get that. And, and I know people are tired of my narrative. But, you know, I remember before we had a full-time AD, we had an athletic issue going on. We, there's always some sort of issue. Not in athletics in general, but there is. I get it. That's part of our job. But what I always try to tell the people is some of those issues don't happen when you have proper staffing in the proper responsibility of supervision in those areas. And I'm not saying we did, knew of that. What I'm just saying is, right, you can oversee things properly. So you can inter you're not reacting, you're responding more accordingly. And so when that issue occurred, I remember everybody was up in arms like, we got to take care of that. We took care of it and we made a full time, not just because of that, but we reconfigured full time AD, facility coordinator, because we also heard the community saying they wanted more access to our buildings. Well, now we might not be able to continue to provide that access that people wanted so much. And we might be going back to and somebody saying, well, how did, how did we know something like this was going on in athletics? Because we don't have enough people anymore supervising if we had to take away a full-time AD. It's just there, there's a chain reaction to everything. And, and it looks great until it's not great. Come on, let's be honest on that. It looks great until it's not great. I'd like to propose that we retain the middle school counselor and the Prairie View keyboarding teacher. Um, I, I don't need a separate meeting. I would ask that we, um, I guess, quote, roll the dice on where our numbers come in for next year. We have options to use ESSER or dip into fund balance if there isn't a, um, you know, any leftovers from from the budget. I'll second that. Okay. By which positions, Anna? Middle school counselor, Prairie View keyboarding teacher. Okay. We have a motion and a second, so discussion. And I'll say this, I'm, I'm fr I've been frustrated by this in the past. You know, I, um, I feel like there's a little bit of a, we always figure it out, and we always find a way. Um, it's just not true. Uh, there, we, we've run out of time. We've, we've run out of time, we've run out of dollars. And um, I would ask that every person in the community, and I'm starting with the five of us and going out from there, who understands why, why we need additional funding from our community, finds one person to explain that to find one person who doesn't yet understand it all and explain it. And I'll meet you for coffee if you need help. It, we're just, we're out of time. We're out of time and we're out of money. And I, I don't know how to say thank you enough to the staff who has, has stuck it out because I'm incredibly thankful for those that are here taking on more than a person's position and serving our kids. Can I amend your motion to say, um, so I'm going to say Anna Janus made a motion to approve the budget with retaining the middle school counselor and Prairie View keyboarding teacher with ESSER and or increasing short-term borrowing. Okay. When, when people see fund balance, they think we have a savings account. We do not have a savings account until fund balance is at the point where we don't have to short-term borrow. Fair enough. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Anybody have 
Dale, any comments, Steve? I've been on this board long enough and gone through so many budget cycles that I agree with you, Anna. This is your first year. Seeing you know, all the stuff we've had to cut in the past, and, and everybody thinks there's so much fat in the budget. That fat is long gone, and we're starting to cut meat. And um, when that starts happening, you're, you're affecting the whole district. And, and all you naysayers out there, um, I, I would restate what Anna said. I'll meet with you any time, and I have in the past. Um, go over it with you and answer your questions. I'm happy to do that any time. So. Yeah, it's going to be all the same points that we've been saying the last how many years. It's, it's not changed. All the same exact reasons. All the years I've been on the board, are the same reasons are still there. It's not going to change. You can only stretch something so far before it snaps. And I agree with everything that's said. Um, these positions, I mean, definitely I want to see them kept in the district. It's important for our district. All the positions are that we're cutting. It's. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also very concerned about we're now facing a $2 million probably cut yeah. next year or balancing effort of some type which is something that's a number we've never faced before. It's going to be difficult. I'm concerned, too. What was that? I am concerned about the fund balance and the ESSER funds depleting. So. Like I said at the last meeting, it's up to the community. The community is going to have to support helping us to find a way to balance this next year. Any other comments? Okay. All in favor? Oh. Yes. And I said this uh, online. I mean, there are m many longer-term solutions to f fixing our, our money problems. There are not as many short-term solutions to fixing our money problems. So when we say we need the community to come along with us and demand a referendum, acknowledge a referendum, understand that we're asking you to invest in your local community, and that is the, the, the short-term answer. There's lots of ways to offset this longer term. Lots of ways. And again, I'd be happy to talk about that as well. Maybe not lots, but a handful of ways. Short-term, we're, go we're going, going to need to be able to pay for these positions moving forward. And that's right. We're looking for, ultimately, for a long-term answer so we don't have to go to referendum. I think every school is looking for that answer. But why is every school going to referendum? It doesn't mean don't work on it. But the problem is, even if it works, it's going to take five, six, seven years, whatever, however long it takes to get to the long-term answer. Right. What's left by that point? We need something to help now to, so we can work on those long-term ones. OK, if no other discussion. All in favor of approval, say aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed. Motion carries. Another ground hogs day is done, Tony. Okay, next item, approval of teacher salary increase without contracts, within contracts. Sorry. On page 71, you have a list of the teacher contracts we would be preparing. Um, by statute, they need to be out May 15th. Um, and the proposal, again, that is built into the budget that you just passed is a 4.7% straight increase to the contractual salaries. Um, that is CPI following the 
Wisconsin Employment Relo Relations Commission releases CPI for units that renew July 1st of the coming year and it takes into account an average of previous 12 months inflation. Um, let's see, what else can I tell you? Oh, we have a salary schedule that would not be followed with this increase. Our normal teacher salary schedule has a few steps, I'll call them, that increase normally at 1.5% higher than CPI and 0.5 higher than CPI. So there's a group of about five steps that are at one and a half normally higher than CPI and then another five steps that are normally half a percent higher than CPI. That would have made, if we continued, would have been a five point something, like a 5.3 or a 5.4 overall total package with CPI being so high this year. Um, and normally we put a 2% into our budget assumptions when we're trying to, again, get the number that we're gonna balance. We knew inflation was gonna be higher, so in November, switched it to 4%, then it ended up even being a little higher at 4.7. So basically the thought process was that's high enough for this year and we're not gonna add those extra increments into the salary schedule to make it even higher. Comments. I guess the only comment I would have that CPI of 4.7, we're actually facing probably seven and a half to eight percent inflation, which, yeah. Absolutely, the current rate, yes, current rate, versus right. the 12 month average from. Correct. Yep. So that's going to be the scary number for next year if that continues throughout the entire next year, all of this year for next year. Absolutely. I Our believe I put a little worse. informational section at the back of your board packets about just that, that Ted's bringing up. And we're coming, we are in a salary freeze uh, year, correct? No, that was one cycle prior. Let one me, cycle prior. I pulled um, last year, CPI was 1.23 because, again, of that way the salary schedule worked that I just explained of those different steps. It ended up being a 2.56 overall for teaching staff, and um, we usually give support staff the same. And it was in 2021 that CPI was 1.81, and we gave a zero. We were going into COVID that year. Um, the virtual learning was going on. There was, again, a threat that we were going to get zero per pupil. It didn't happen that year, but then it happened this year and next year. So two years ago, a zero salary freeze. What's going on in the other districts? It's a mixed deal. Um, we did a couple of big um, surveys. And I would definitely say areas west and north are all 4-7. They're all doing CPI. Areas east and north are a mix. Some are 4-7. Some are more 2, 2 and a half. So next year, CPI is 10%, 11%. Mm -hmm. Then going to come back with a proposal that everybody gets a 10, 11, 12% raise? Not I. <laughs> um, that I would mean, be... at what point does it, I mean, you know. Yes. You're not going to be ever able to keep up with inflation. Yes. At this rate. I mean, right. It, Unless, again, the suffer. state starts giving us funding that's equal to inflation, it's going to be not possible. You're absolutely correct. To keep giving any sort of number that's close to CPI if CPI escalates that high, absolutely. So we just added a huge amount onto our deficit, and now we're going to go CPI and add more on? Absolutely. So again, I mean, I it's think a the choice I think the of the priorities. Yeah. I, I don't deny that the staff mm -hmm. deserves it, but we're just killing ourselves. And that's what the unmitigated disaster of inflation is across the entire economy. It's just a cycle you start getting into, and it's just. Oh, I mean, I don't there's know there's any way no of getting out of this it. thing. If you're, if you're if you're going down this, I don't know any way of getting out of it. You know, everybody says referendum. Okay, so let's do referendum. Referendum fails. Then where are you at? I mean, two have failed already. Then we're at and, a lot and, of and position And that was in a good economy. We're, 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 good, we're not in a good economy. We're reaching a bad economy. 
with everybody's battling this inflation and cost and uh, your prospects of a referendum passing are diminishing considerably. So, you know, what's the end game here, guys? I mean, the, definitely the staff deserves 4.7. Love to keep them. They're great people, you know. But we make decisions to keep staff that we can't afford, you know. We're taking a gamble. I'm just saying, we're taking a big gamble. So maybe, maybe 4% to try to mitigate something. I don't know. They certainly deserve the 4.7, but I don't know what else to do. I know I've talked to Chris about benefits. I spent a lot of time in Chris's office talking about things. So. I don't disagree with you, and um, the only thing, again, I will say is the history has been very low wage increases. Um, you've had that sheet of paper, um, and unfortunately, the result is when you look at our comparables, we are above Palmyra Eagle, but that's usually it as far as the comparables. So, you know, when I look at some of the Milwaukee schools only giving two or two and a half, I think and I look at who they are, they're pretty high already on the comparable wages um, that we've all studied. So I think at that point, you know, you can afford a two and a two and a half. Um, that would be my only two cents. But do I agree that, that it's unsustainable? Absolutely. All of this is unsustainable. The fiscal cliff that we talked about, um, not, you know, if you're not gonna pass a referendum, there's you have to right size your ship with again position reductions or salary and benefit reductions. Yeah, the biggest I, problem with that, that that is why I, I I went against what was the proposal of adding those people on because it's just and we're just hurting ourselves in another place and it's just when uh when it hits the fan it's gonna be worse. So I don't know what the solution at this point is, but I I'll go along with the 4.7, I guess. We have to. It just feels like it's a gamble either way. Either do it and you figure out how to afford it, and if you don't do it, who's going to want to keep working here? Well, right. the thing of it was that we weren't cutting any programs, like Chris said. That's the key, not to cut programs. We had the discussion to increase programs. I've had this discussion with Chris to increase programs, you know. Um, Maybe we'll t we'll have a little bit of discussion about that tonight, uh, a little bit too. But uh, I'm just saying. You know, the other problem coming up, well, it's already happening, is staffing overall and availability of people. So the lower we make that salary schedule or not increase it to what inflation's hitting it at us at. We're going to lose more people, not just to other educational facilities, but just leaving the profession overall. It's just staff is getting hard to find. It's just the nature of the economy everywhere. Yeah, I get that. I mean, the only, usually, when you have this high inflation, usually what happens that follows is a recession. I don't know if that's going to happen this time. What's kind of unique about this situation is that there's a lot of jobs that were created. There's still a lot of demand for teachers and a lot of skilled trades and all the, those type of jobs. There's still a lot of demand for all that. So uh, particularly the district's in a position where we have to retain who we have, but we're also battling the same inflation issues within the school for money, uh, for utilities, construction costs gasoline and everything else so it's a tough spot just made it a little tougher I'll make a motion to approve teacher salary increases to 4.7 percent I'll second it okay discussion again All in favor of approval, say aye. 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 Opposed? 
Motion carries. Uh, middle school planning guide. All right, so that is me. Uh, so in your board packets, you should have a copy of the latest middle school planning guide for next school year, so 2022-2023. Um, the planning guide for the middle school is kind of in its infancy. This is actually only the third edition of it, so it's kind of what exciting that, that we have it. 79. 79. Um, so there's uh, not a lot of updates in it this year. Um, as always with the planning guides, we go through, look at the grammar, is there... Um, language that we could reduce or simplify in it so we made some of those changes um, with the shift towards uh, standards-based grading and reporting processes the grading scale um, has been replaced with the grading and reporting section so it's not um, intended to be a whole long list of the practices but just what is utilized at the middle school so that's been added um, in addition, the math course progressions have also been added in there as well. So you can see what an accelerated pathway looks like as well as the standard math pathway. So that's been added in there. So we, we've always had it, we just didn't have it in the planning guide. So that way it's accessible for our students to be able to see. And then just some language stuff. So some of the ACP lessons um, had some uh, language updates within there. And then the remaining items on there all surround the grade levels specifics in which we're able to offer specific courses. So for example, our tech ed um, is offered for all of our grade levels, um, but the actual length of it varies because of our staffing and when we're actually able to put that into the schedule. Same thing with our business courses, ag courses. And so we wanted to be really specific so that way our students could see in sixth grade, if you take agriculture, for example, this is really what you focus on in seventh grade, this is what you focus on in eighth grade. So we broke up some of that language so it's a little bit easier whether you're in sixth, seventh, or eighth, you can see that. You, may, you might say, you know, I really I want to take ag in eighth grade instead of sixth grade based on the description. And then the only course descriptions that changed this year and they didn't really change very much would be the robotics. Uh, because uh, what we found is that really what's happening is we're integrating um, students into this robotics two course and because it's so highly personalized, they're able to select from a variety of themes and they can repeat the course. Um, so instead of having them separate, you either use this theme or this theme, it's all integrated together. So those are really the big changes this year. Any questions? I'll make a motion to approve the middle school planning guide. I'll second. Discussion? Sure, I think it's great. I love the detail. I love, yeah. you know, I, before you had the templates for everybody, right? I mean, how simplified have you made it for people? I, I think it's great. Thank you. Um, one of the things we're going to keep working towards is also that 612 look so we're hoping to see more of that and with the additions that you saw at the high school for the pathways as well we're right. hoping that we can get to a point where maybe we can start adding that in the middle school a little bit more too that was the question i was just about to ask actually this is my first time reading it i was very impressed with um just the the descriptions of the courses and you know trying to help kids see where they fit and what they might be interested or curious about so yeah, I think it's um, really well done. Yeah, That's it wasn't always this way. And this I was gonna is, say. it's great for everybody, for yeah. the students, for the parents. Um, I can't say enough. Remember when you did it at the high school? Um, make it so easy for the students. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions, discussion? All in favor of approval, say aye. 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 Opposed? Middle school planning guides approved. Thanks, Sarah. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, start college now and early college credit applications. So that'll be me tonight as well. So hi, Sarah Eckert again. Uh, so you have a long list of applications in your board packet um, for start college now and early college credit program. So it is a statute, so we are required to 
offer these opportunities for our students, but they're amazing opportunities where students are able to take college level courses to gain college credit while also getting high school credit as well. So the applications that you have in your packets are for a variety of offerings. Um, you will see some duplicates in there. So you might be like, why are there duplicates? That seems really strange. Um, but you'll notice that they're for what Gateway calls academies and then also the Gateway courses and the courses look the same. But there's a, a difference between them. The academies are specifically for high school students. So they're for high school students, they're composed of high school students, but it also fills up. So there's a wait list um, for some of them, they've already closed already, and we wanna make sure that those students have an opportunity to still take the courses. So the second application that you'll see that is not for the academy, but is a Start College Now gateway application, that's for similar class, so it's the same class, it's through Gateway, but instead of being only high school students, it's open to anybody who can enroll in Gateway. So that's the difference. So if they're not able to get into the academy, we wanna make sure that they're still able to apply and take those um, other courses as well. So within the academy, we actually had eight students that applied for that. Uh, within their liberal arts and sciences program, their welding program, and their fire and EMS program. For Start College Now at Gateway, we had a total of 15 students, or 15 applications, I should say, um, ranging from a wide array of classes, from welding courses, their business courses, marketing courses, the medical and healthcare fields in there, uh, CNA, macro and microeconomics, there are some CNC courses in there, um, within the liberal arts and sciences academy, courses in there, accounting, software apps. So there's a wide range um, in there, but you'll also notice that there are some recurring themes that we see as well. We did have one student for Start College now um, applying for Waukesha, uh, Waukesha County uh, Technical College for the firefighting uh, courses, so they're looking to pursue that. And then we had four students that put in applications for an ASL1 course through what Gateway calls Vanguard. So that's similar to the SART College Now classes in that they are Gateway instructed courses, but the difference is they are virtual. It's a virtual course and it's held here at East Troy High School, so students take it virtually. There is a duplicate application for that as well, so you're probably like, Sarah, why is there another duplicate application? Because uh, Gateway has said that they may be offering it as an in-person <coughs> option, and so we have one student who has elected that if they can take it as in-person, they would like to if they offer that. And then the other two applications that are in there, one is for a dual enrollment academy through Waukesha as well, which is the early childhood education program. And then we had one student that is applying for the early college credit program, specifically for Carroll University and is looking to take anatomy and physiology. So there's a, a lot in there. Could you explain the in layman's terms, the financial impact of all these classes and so on and so forth? I can do my best. I'd, I'm probably not the best person to ask about that because I don't oversee all that. There's basically a course charge, um, ends up being about $350 per student per course. We don't have any choice in the matter to be able to pay it though. It's one of the unfunded mandates, I'll say that came several years ago is that we had to provide these options and we had to pay for them, but no additional funding for them. So. So these are just for college level courses that are not offered at the high school. Because I've been seeing some welding, gas, metal arc, shielded metal arc. Um, 
printing fab. I know we got a fab shop, so. Uh, I see uh, also CNC. Do you instruct CNC? You have a CNC instructor that teaches the kids how to operate a CNC? And it's part of a metal course, but not, it's not exactly the same. I mean, state law indicates it has to be comparable to the same. So just because we have a unit on CNC within a class doesn't mean we can deny a college level CNC class. So that, and that's all, like Sarah referenced, that's all within the state statute. So the majority of the classes, really when you look at them, we, we don't offer a comparable course here. Um, so part of the process that the counselors actually go through with the students, there's, it's not in your packet, but there's a long checklist that they actually utilize within policy as well. Um, and part of that is double checking. Does this course have a similar experience here? And like Stacy said, oftentimes it's the level that the course is being college level that we don't have, or it goes more in depth than we have here as well. And they can take up to 18, is it? <laughs> Correct. 18. It so used to be called youth options, Dale. Maybe that rings a bell. So before they went to early college credit, it's uh, secondary now. It used to be called uh, youth options. But as Kathy stated, it, it's been around for some time. And it is really, uh, I don't know how else to say it, it is an unfunded mandate. I mean, we're proud of the fact that our kids have that opportunity to get these credits. I mean, we put plaques up in the district office about how many kids have that opportunity. So, I mean, it's, it's great in that they're able to take advantage of it. We make sure that it doesn't align to anything we're already offering, but like Stacy said, it has to meet that credential. Uh, the only problem from a district level lens is that uh, we have to pay the cost. Right, so Cal these kids are getting some great opportunities to get nine credits, 18 credits, going into a, their career or, or their college already. So I mean, that's, that's phenomenal. I'm, I'm very proud of that fact. So I just wish it was funded. If we were to partner with Gateway, I'm just kind of thinking out loud here, partner with Gateway and bring Gateway into the school and offer those classes like in welding and CNC machine, stuff like that, make them college classes, so then would we still have to fund that, or how would that work? Yes, yeah. so that's similar to what Sarah was talking about with the contracted course. So even if we would say, Gateway, come and teach welding at East Trey High School from two to four, we would contract that class, and that would mean we still would have to pay per student that took that class. So just because you're in your build, they're in your building, if it's their instructor, Gateway's going to charge you the same tuition as if you went to Gateway. So the only way out of it is to beef up the beef up the programs to the point where they're college credit qualified. We'd have to become Gateway. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good way to say that. Yeah, pr pretty much, we'd have to be a tech school. Or Carroll or WCTC or one of them, mm -hmm. but. I mean, we can increase programming around the edges if we had the funding to support a few more of these classes, but we'd never be able to replace all of them. There's a certification issue that comes in, into play here, too. We are teachers who have to be adjunct professors, and while we are with 24 classes, you know, it's, it's a lot harder in, like, gen eds. You have to have a master's degree within that subject area. So you can't have a master's degree in administration or curriculum or business manager. You have to have a master's degree of English or a master's degree in math. And that just it limits your pool of who can teach those courses. So you get some college level red tape with that. Gotcha. And to hire teachers like that, you'd be paying what a master's in English or a master's in math would be getting somewhere else, which is way beyond our budget. Mm -hmm. Today, 
Vice-Chair's job market? There hasn't been a motion for this yet, has there? Did I? I th but there hasn't been a motion no. yet, right? I'll make a motion to approve the Start College Now and Early College Credit applications as presented. Second. Okay, discussion? Okay, all in favor of approval, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. School funding support letter. Uh, in your packet, uh, it's kind of the letter that we, it's not kind of, it's the letter we kind of actually alluded to in the budget component and we were wondering uh, for the board to have discussion action on it. Uh, I'll just read it. As business and education leaders, we have taken a keen interest in the state's K-12 education system and its role in developing talent for our economy. Given the recently announced increase in state reserves, we encourage you to invest a portion of the $5.5 billion to support improved educational outcomes. K-12 education is directly linked to one of the most important roles the state has, developing its citizens as lifelong learners capable of adapting to the changing needs of our economy and our communities. As such, the state's budget surplus creates a historic opportunity to invest in our children and schools. Making an investment in K-12 education by utilizing a portion of the stated $5.5 billion surplus could be accomplished in the following two ways. One, an inflationary adjustment of $343 per pupil. The last state budget did not provide a per pupil increase for Wisconsin's K-12 schools, including those public independent charter and schools and schools in the parental choice program. The addition of new one-time federal elementary and secondary school emergency relief, the ESSER funds, were extremely helpful, but explicitly earmarked the pande for pandemic related learning losses. Schools are struggling to maintain current programming and retain crucially needed staff, challenges that will outlast the pandemic funding and face the headwind of growing inflationary pressures. According to information from the State Legislative Fiscal Bureau, had the per pupil indexing mechanism been placed for the 2021-2022 school year, students would have received a positive adjustment of $342.82. Two, a 50% reimbursement rate to support students with disabilities. As noted by the Blue Ribbon Commission on School Funding and highlighted by research from the Wisconsin Policy Forum, Wisconsin continues to trail the nation in funding funding support for students with disabilities. Of all states with a reimbursement system, Wisconsin's rate of 28.18% is the country's lowest reimbursement rate. This funding flows to support students most in need while ensuring the schools they attend have adequate resourcing to meet their needs. The estimated investment for these initiatives would be less than $700 million. We believe these adjustments to school funding strike both a need and a balance a need to invest in the quality of our K-12 education with the rich return it provides in developing our future talent and the balancing of maintaining the state's strong fiscal position. Thank you again for your leadership. We look forward to working together to secure this opportunity for Wisconsin children. And so that, that is the letter that we wanted to bring forward that we know is out there uh, with districts and businesses and everything else. We wanted to have the board discuss and to find out if you are comfortable uh, per an action of sending this uh, with the East Troy School Board. Uh, it's approval and blessing. Uh, and if not, if there's not a full motion and, and, and approval, understandably so, we won't. Uh, I still will be signing mine as a superintendent due to the fact other superintendents have been. And, and I, I honestly believe I am fully supportive of, of them highly considering additional dollars into the educational funding uh, due to the fact of the zero dollar per pupil increase, the u current use of ESSER, and I really do believe in the higher percentage for reimbursement with students with disabilities in comparison to the nation right now. So, I, but I will not obviously just say, oh, Superintendent Dr. Chris Hibner and board without the board's blessing. So please feel free to have a discussion. I'll make a motion to approve the request to send a letter on behalf of the school board to the state. Second. Discussion. I have a question. Is this the Blue Ribbon Commission? I think I read that quite a few years ago. Is that 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 one that's been around forever and kind of went nowhere, and they're kind of like done now? I don't know if that's the same one or not. I guess I'm not. Is there sure. a new one? There's always Blue Ribbon Commissions. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just remember reading it. it. Sounded like they were onto something, and then it just disappeared. Yeah, I'm not sure. 
can we have them add um, funding to start college now? <laughs> <laughs> What's the current reimbursement rate um, for special ed? I think with 28.8 they put in, or 28.18, yeah. Oh yeah, it's right there. It was supposed to be um, up to 30 in the last biennial, but they, the way the law is written, it depends how many people claim it. And so like it's 30% it's of the dollars at that point in time, well then if more people claim it, then the reimbursement rate per school dwindles down to meet the sum sufficient amount that sure. was put in the pot. If it's okay with the rest of the board, um, I'd also recommend that we, um, or I could give it to the chamber to have them pass around the business sector in the community to see if they could sign a similar letter, as it says from business and education leaders. Why not? Great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's good. Well, any other discussion? All in favor of approval, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, overnight field trip request. For uh, Ryan Mansky, who oversees our hunch program here at the high school to take the two teams um, that made the finals um, down to the NASA um, headquarters as part of that um, club. So I just want to read just the first paragraph that is um, on his proposal, because I think it's important that everybody understands what it is since, since clubs and activities are part of our budget line item this year. But it says, hello, the NASA Hunch program involves teams from across the country developing projects for NASA. This year, East Trey High School had two teams that designed projects. One team designed magnetic boots that would be worn by astronauts in space, and the other team developed a module that is designed to complete experiments in space involving mushrooms. I, th I find, find it impressive. So they, they um, every year it's impressive, um, but they presented to some of the astronauts that came in and then a team of engineers uh, that gave feedback, Ted was one of them, on the designs. We hosted Racine uh, and Platteville High Schools came and Ryan hosts every year uh, the design review, they call it. And it's just a very impressive um, club and event for all. Uh, so I just wanted to make a plug for him uh, and all the students that are involved this year and have been involved in that, that club. So he is requesting permission to take them on the field trip um, April 13th through 16th or 17th. Yeah, I was very impressed with both projects that East Troy presented, um, especially in relationship to Platteville and Racine. They had similar types of um, themes they're developing, and East Troy's both teams, I think, did an excellent job. That's great. So, I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Discussion. Stacy, on here, it says it's between three to six people, one chaperone. So we're talking a total of maybe eight, nine people. On um, this? It's six. Um, th what the, what he's referring to is there's six kids going and two chaperones. Okay, so, so three eight. to six. So eight total. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes. Okay. So it looks like they have to. Most of it's covered. They have to pay for their dinner at two nights or whatever. The rest is pretty much covered. Uh, with their fundraising? Yes, they it? fundraise to cover it, um, cover the event for themselves, yes. Okay. And it, you'll see on the bottom there is some COVID protocol that's obviously new this year. Um, so the families do understand that if they get COVID while they're down there and are quarantined, that they are responsible for the hotel for the remainder of the time. Okay. And they have not done this for two years now because of COVID? Correct, yeah. yes. They're very excited to be able to go. We weren't sure, so mm -hmm. they're very Right. Okay, any other discussion, questions? Okay, all in favor of approval, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, notice of school board election. Uh, notice is hereby given that an election to be held in the East Ray Community School District on Tuesday, April 5th, 2022. The following offices are to be elected to succeed the present school board members, Bob Dignan and Ted Zess. 
The terms of office for the school board members will begin on Monday, April 25th, 2022 in accordance with Wisconsin statute. Candidates with the highest vote count will fill, the, fill two three-year term positions. Uh, Village of East Troy is Village Municipal Building, Town of East Troy, Town Hall, Town of Troy, Town Hall, Town of Lafayette, Town Hall, Town of Spring Prairie, Town Hall, Town of LaGrange, Town Hall, Town of Eagle, Town Hall, and Village of McGuanago, Village Hall. The polls will be open at 7 o'clock a.m. and close at 8 o'clock p.m. unless otherwise stated by the municipality. The electors are directed to vote in their normal or regular polling place. Ballot position and candidates for the two open board positions are as follow. Um, Vote for two, uh, one, Adam Wickowitz, two, Kevin Bong, three, Adam Lamar, four, Ted Zess. Uh, dated this 21st day of February 2022 when this was written and signed by Steve Lambricks. Uh, so that is for just the notice of the school board election. And I just want to remind in the front, on the front, on the notice, obviously it was official at that component in time, which was for school board members Bob Dingen and Ted Zess. And Bob uh, has officially resigned obviously and Tony was uh, put into that seat uh, kind enough to seek and ask if he uh, could be considered by the board which he was and he is filling in until uh, the date of the new candidates are um, sworn in. Thanks Chris. Um, choose board of canvassers for election in April. Yeah, so again, as always, uh, we always have to do the canvassing and we look for three reputable citizens. Uh, the clerk is always one of them, uh, and that is at this current time, Steve is the clerk, so Steve would be one of those citizens. Uh, and then we always look for two additional ones. I nominate Stacy. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like she has enough to do. I was waiting for that, Steve. I'm like, I'll just let Steve do that. <laughs> oh, Sarah wants in? Sarah wants in too? Okay, there we go. We're done. Stacy and Sarah, that is going to need a motion in a second still. So yep. Steve made the motion. Since Anna didn't show up last I'll time, second. we have to find a replacement. You're right. I kept my sick germs to myself. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. Any discussion? All in favor of approval, say aye. 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 Opposed? Terry will follow up with all three of you then on the date and time. All right. Summer school update. Uh, let me, Amy, put together uh, well-written and uh, information in your packets. I'll just hit on a few of the things. So, uh, as you know, she's been updating the board and the community uh, regularly in regards to our summer school and uh, what we're always proud of, but we had some challenges, and that was staffing uh, this year. And it's not the first time we've had challenges in summer school, but even more so this year. And we did a survey, and obviously people just want the break. Uh, more so this year than ever before. So, um, so all summer school courses this year will be in person, as we, we've stated. Uh, but as we discussed at the February meeting, the districts, uh, the, the district of East Troy is experiencing a number of staff challenges. In February, there were a number of courses offered during the 2021 summer session that were unfilled. At that time, uh, Amy had presented that there were 18 elementary courses, exploratory and support classes that were unfilled, nine middle school courses, exploratory, and support classes and five high school courses, uh, which was, was including both credit recovery and for credit courses. Uh, she attempted, as she stated in February, uh, with all the openings, she posted things on weekend. She did have eight applicants, as she's put it in her, in her uh, summer school update, uh, apply uh, of the eight, eight candidates. Uh, all eight candidates were offered an interview, four had accepted, and three accepted uh, to be added to the summer school list at that time. So then what um, she provided was elementary offerings, right? Due to the staffing shortages still, we are not able to offer math and reading support classes at the elementary level for 5K through fifth grade this year. Um, however, getting ready for 5K will be offered to the recommended students. Outside of getting ready for 5K, the elementary summer school sessions will only include exploratory offerings. Uh, it should be noted that the number of offerings is limited and we expect that classes will quickly reach capacity. The courses listed below will be part of our elementary summer school programming. So I'll announce it to everybody watching. Courses offered at Little Prairie the primary this year uh, will be Animal Explorers, Beginning Spanish, Book Cooks, Camp Fun, Getting ready for 5K, two sections planned due to student need, uh, little scientists, STEAM in the smart lab, and yoga. Uh, courses offered at the Prairie View Elementary, graphic novels, beginning Spanish, 
crafty kids, let's have a ball, kitchen chemistry, mad scientists, mindfulness and me, strategy board games, smart lab, worldly travelers, yoga, band lessons for fifth grade. Uh, together, our 2021 session included a total of 38 elementary offerings. This year, we have 20 elementary offerings. So uh, down 18, and again, it's, it's staffing. Uh, middle school offerings, fortunately, uh, we are able to offer recommended 6-8, uh, math 6-8, and recommended reading 6-8. So we are going to provide that at the middle school. Additionally, we will run a limited number of exploratory offerings, though, for middle school students. Again, she makes a, a comparison. Our 2021 session included a total of 12 middle school offerings. This year we have nine middle school offerings. All middle school offerings for this summer also uh, can be found below, and they will be at uh, the high school due to our HVAC project that will be occurring. Uh, courses offered at the Eastern Middle School will be recommended math, recommended reading, community kindness, Mindfulness and Me, Reading is a Mystery, Scrapbooking, Strategy Board Games, Smart Lab, and Band Lessons. Um, she also did inform me right before uh, Ms. Fospanchik uh, is not here, obviously, tonight, before she had left, she said, unfortunately, uh, she was informed that she has lost now a summer school teacher uh, for one of the classes. So they, we, are, we will be down one more teacher and that is this teacher is up at the high school so that'll be something else that she will be looking to work on but most likely we will be down a high school teacher for the summer and for the high school offerings uh, so people are aware at the high school we always offer credit recovery and content areas such as math English science and social studies uh, additionally high school offerings will include agricultural leadership uh, adventures and fitness uh, but that may not that's I believe that is the uh, position that the individual informed her uh, they were no longer going to be doing uh, creative writing and summer jazz symposium um, again she notes it should be noted that due to staffing shortages we are not able to run three high school classes that had been offered in previous years those were for credit economics for credit formal composition and marching band uh, as in previous years, summer school registration will also be completed online. Online registration, I'm going to state this so everyone's clear on it, will be open on April 11th at 6 o'clock a.m. and will close at the end of the day on April 24th. Again, registration will open on April 11th at 6 o'clock a.m. and will close at the end of the day on April 24th. And I would highly recommend everybody signing up as soon as possible due to the uh, lack of staffing and uh, limited course offerings, even though we've done our best, uh, as Amy alluded to, they will fill up quickly. All right, thanks, Chris. Um, professional staff employment, contract not renewal, non-renewal? Executive session. And professional employment, personnel issue update? Uh, that'll go into executive session also. Okay. Updates. You have anything to I make do this? Okay. Uh, Kathy? So I have on page 174 through 176 a summary from, if you recall, two board meetings ago, our representative for insurances was at the meeting. He was virtual. And the request was to bring back some comparables. So I asked him. Um, to do that and um, I told him he didn't need to come tonight but if you want him back he will certainly be happy to come back um, but on page 174 are nine different districts and how they compare with their health plans in 21-22 and a couple of lines I'll point out um, first of all third from the bottom okay third from the bottom is the employer contribution so how much of a single plan or a family plan does the school district pick up? So you can read across like 87.4% is the first school, 90% with biometrics, 80% without is the second school. The next school is East Troy, 82% if staff are picking up the $501,000 plan. 88% if staff are picking up the $2,000, $4,000 plan. And you keep going across 
90%, year-round staff 87.4%, the next 88, 87.4, 87.4, and then 77. So I will say with the exception of Wilmot, which is the very last district there contributing 77%, our base plan, which is the 2,000 single, 4,000 family deductible, um, is right in the ballpark of, again, 87% to 90% employer contributions, okay? So up at, the cro up, up at the top, you know, you can see, again, the school districts. Sometimes a school district is listed twice. Again, East Troy is listed two times because we have two different health plans. Our base plan is the second one, again, with the $2,000, $4,000 deductible, so if you go down one, two, three, four lines, four rows are how the deductibles compare, okay? So again, we have a 2,000, 4,000 for base plan. Just to the left of it, if employees want to pay more, then they can take the 500 to $1,000 deductible plan. We say they buy up or they pay the difference um, to get themselves to that plan. And then, again, how do people compare with deductibles? Well, you have to do one kind of math step first. The row above, or the third row down, do you see where it says HRA, HSA contribution? That gets subtracted from people's deductibles. So, for example, in the very first column, the school says they have a 2,500 single deductible, 5,000 family, but you have to subtract what they are offsetting that deductible with in an HRA, HSA. We don't have that, okay? So our deductible is a true deductible. So once you do that math, again, our base plan of 2,000, 4,000 is, I believe, if I remember correctly after looking through this, like the highest deductible um, in comparability to any of these eight other schools. Now again, this is just eight other schools that are located around us and that our same insurance rep works with. We could get comparables in many more situations, but every time I've looked at it again, I think we have a base plan that is very comparable to other school districts, if not, again, a little higher deductible, a little higher employer, um, or excuse me, employee contribution than the others. Okay, so that's health. And then on page 175, the same thing was done with long-term disability. And um, so long-term disability, as the rep mentioned, there's only two districts in the state that don't offer it. It is um, if you become disabled, um, and then there's qualifications to meet that definition of disability you would recoup some form of your income. So if you fell off a ladder at home and you couldn't teach anymore, couldn't be a custodian anymore, you would have um, some income recovery until the point in time when you were hopefully able to come back um, and not be disabled anymore, if that's possible even. So you may have the different you know, situations there of local, again, districts. Um, and how they compare. And then on the bottom as well is life. And life, we do offer two times a salary in our life benefit. And you'll see a lot of other districts offer only one times a salary. So we've had it on the budget reduction sheet in the past. It would save about $21,000, if I remember correctly, um, to go from two times a salary to one times a salary in the future. It's more, again, about the message of you know, do we want to go through a benefits adjustment or not? Um, you know, I will say we, we, when you were having your discussions about, again, what should we cut, what should be the philosophy, word I've lived for for a long time is balance. Um, you know, you can't cut all the positions in a district, you wouldn't have a district. So you can't do everything with position reductions. You can't balance the budget completely on salaries and benefits your staff would leave. You can't balance the budget completely on fund balance um, decreasing because then in three years you wouldn't have a school district anymore. 
So you try to balance all of these philosophies and principles as much as you can and, and keep it going, all of them, all the balls in the air and all the plates spinning as long as you can. Um, but it will definitely, I think, next year be a year again where if we have no fiscal cliff relief, if we don't have any increases in per pupil funding, if we go to referendum and we don't pass it, we will need to be you know, reducing these benefits more. So one, go down to one times the salary in life insurance. That'll save you 21,000. But the other areas, if we do something there, we're not gonna be comparable to save um, whatever funds that allows us to save. And then the last page 176 is just a history of our usage of the long-term disability insurance. Um, so you can see you know, what was collected from the district as far as premiums go and then what was paid out. Um, this year we have an active case right now, so there's something called open reserves and then an IBNR is incurred um, but not paid out yet, so they're expecting to make that payment in like the next month. Um, and then open reserves are what is expected on the life of the claim yet. So the point in our rep giving me this sheet, he said, is that we're not paying premiums and getting nothing. Um, in fact, like if the claims come to fruition that are open right now, it will be about balanced a little bit a higher loss ratio than 100%, even um, more paid out than what we've paid in for long-term disability. So that's a quick summary on my part of what the rep provided as far as benefits and comparables. What other questions? What else can we get? What would you like to see? Can something like this, um, like say long-term disability, mm -hmm. can, um, we self-fund that with a cap? Oh, that's a good question. I can look into that. We do self-fund dental right now. Um, I can look into it. Okay. Other questions, other um, things to look at? Life insurance. Maybe the same thing? Um, again, I can look into it and ask the I life mean, insurance. Maybe not as easily, but you yeah. know, some look into it. The life insurance is connected with our Wisconsin retirement system. So I think that one would be much more difficult to take on ourselves, but I can discuss. So I have another question. Do you guys file a tax return at all? Nope. We are tax exempt as a school district. Um, there is a um, form, IRS form 4136, that allows for uh, recapture of uh, well, the federal uh, tax credits for fuel for agricultural and some uh, fuel for uh, buses. Um, have you ever looked at anything like that? I mean, you, you... There's grants that come up where, like, if we improve our diesel fleet, so if we get a new bus, we get percentages back on um, the cost of the bus because it'll improve the emissions, for example. And we've utilized those when we can, um, but we're not eligible to do any of the federal tax rebate forms. Because it is a credit... Yeah, and we're not you, eligible. And, and you're just not eligible to apply for those credits. Well. We don't file taxes. I, I get that, but yeah. I think I think it passes on to a into a 1040 that you just you don't have to declare any income or anything. We don't file you, a 1040. We don't. Public school districts don't file taxes. We're tax exempt as an entity, as an organization. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I'm on the lookout for, we get grants. Again, we, we well, will I'm file any that grant. There's, um, and like for example, when they did the uh, 
child tax credits these last years for COVID, uh, the government was saying, hey, even if you don't file a tax return, file one anyway, we're gonna give you the 1400 or $2,800, whatever they gave. So I started to think, well, maybe, even yeah, though no. normally you don't file a tax return, if you do file one, uh, maybe that money. I'm just, and it may yeah. not be a lot of money anyway, you know, um, but it was just uh, a thought that I had yeah. about, you well, know. Usually when any of those government incentives come out, they come out with um, you're eligible as a private business or you're eligible as a public sector government. So we know right away whether we can claim it or whether we can. Okay. Yeah. There is some stuff in uh, about biodiesel. Is there some credits for biodiesel and things like that, you know? So, um, I'm just wondering, I mean, I mean, do you, when you buy your diesel fuel and things like that, do you pay the state tax? Do you pay the federal tax on it? No. So you don't even pay those taxes anyway? No. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's what I'm wondering. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then our accounts payable person does an excellent job about, you know, any bill that is received that has taxes on it. Nope, here's our tax exempt form. Here's our tax exempt form. Take the taxes off. Okay. Yeah. All right, thanks, Kathy. Um, Sarah, in place of Amy. Yeah, so I'm um, not the fabulous Amy Fosspancheck, but I'll do my best. Um, so she wanted to pass along an update on the Student Learning Subcommittee from the last meeting, so that would have been February 14th. The meeting surrounded textbook adoption process for social studies, particularly establishing an instructional view. So the meeting began with just an introduction to materials that were developed by CISA 1 that were related to the development of an instructional view as part of a curriculum resource um, or the textbook adoption process, um, and in particular, social studies. So there are three key components of an instructional vision that includes, communicates the expectations for teaching and learning. Number two, serves as a shared language and decision-making framework for investments in time and money across all levels of the system. And three, provides a common space for dialogue about what effective instruction looks like and a way to compare the vision to actual practice. So the committee reviewed the vision for Wisconsin Social Studies that was actually developed by the state superintendent's K-12 Social Studies Advisory Committee. And they also looked at policy 110, so our educational philosophy policy, and our six C's materials look for document as well. So the state's instructional vision aligns with the newly revised uh, social studies standards, so the Wisconsin academic standards that we've adopted. So it's the recommendation of the student learning subcommittee that we adopt the state's vision since it aligns with uh, the state standards. Um, and in addition, the Student Learning Committee recommends including language from Policy 110, so our educational philosophy, into the instructional vision. So um, I believe you have a copy of this, hopefully you do. Um, but the recommendation is included below. So you'll notice that on the left, the instructional vision focuses on Again, our social studies content, and then the right side incorporates the six C's and our educational philosophy as well. Which I don't know if you want me to read it out loud or, or not, I can, <laughs> but it's there. Okay. So right. that's what the committee looked at. So the, the hope is um, as we continue and go through the curriculum review process that will incorporate instructional visions for each content area and those will be created and revised as we go through that process and co new content standards come and that process with DPI. All right, thanks Sarah. Yeah, thank you. Um, Kate, anything else to add tonight? Okay, and I have no reports so we have no policy review and development, uh, communications announcements. I just have one really quick uh, for my aspect, and that is I wanted to recognize our 
food service program. They deserve to be recognized all the time, along with many other uh, departments. But I wanted to recognize them due to the fact March 7th through the 11th uh, was National uh, School Breakfast Week. And I just want to thank them for their outstanding efforts of providing school nutrition to our students, uh, to thank each and every one of the employees within the food service department throughout our district, and to thank the uh, director of food service, Ms. Ruth Bentley, um, for all of their efforts, each and every one of them, due to the fact I think they just do a, an outstanding job of providing proper um, school nutrition to our kids and supporting our community. Um, not only during obviously the difficult time during the pandemic the last few years, but prior to that and uh, during it. So again, just for the National School Breakfast Week, but beyond that, I wanted to make sure that they got uh, the proper recognition and, and thank you from everyone. Okay. All right, anybody on the board have any future items they'd like added? Uh, Chris, I'm wondering if we could have a conversation about, I've had people ask me why we don't charge a facilities use fee for clubs using the facilities. Um, I wonder if we could revisit the facility use fee. And I just know that like club team basketball, right, they charge their those kids to come and use the gym. And we don't charge that. We historically have not charged clubs. But if you want to play middle school basketball, you're charged a fee. Um, to do that, and I believe that fee goes into the school district, whereas the club fees do not go into the school district at all. We'll take a look again at the facility use, but I wanted to make sure of the clarity. So uh, the people that have been reaching out, you are wondering about the, the fee structure for facility use, and it's more in regards to in-district clubs? Right, right, which we historically have not charged uh, facilities use fee, I believe. But we're not talking about exterior, ex, uh, exterior district clubs. We're talking about in district. No, in di right because exterior yeah, right. we do charge. Correct. Yes. Right. That's why I just want to make sure. Yep. I think we should at least talk about it. I don't know if it's yep. the right thing to do, but we can put it on a next agenda though to look at the facility and talk talk it through again. Right. And can I right. bring up here something, Dale? I was wrong. Because I know, again, we're always taking taxes off of every bill because we're tax exempt. If we get charged any taxes, we're always sending in, nope, we're tax exempt, we get it removed. But on diesel fuel, we are not tax exempt. Wisconsin municipalities and school districts are not exempt. Okay. Okay, so well, in that vein, um, that form will allow you to go tax exempt. It allows you to recapture that, even though you don't normally file at 1040 but it uh, I'll, I'll check into it but I, I remember doing something like this at my previous district and then I was told no we didn't get the credit but I'll look into it okay okay there is a, there is a uh, a dyed diesel for agricultural purposes I don't know if we're paying I know we got some agricultural activity because we, we are growing some crops and things the ag department is there's a dyed diesel that it's tax exempt and non road diesel. Yeah, because um, it's gasoline and undyed diesel fuel are yeah. not exempt. Yeah. Okay. I'll look into it and see what and I can that, come up with. That, that includes things like waterways, um, where you have your bees and everything. That's all kind of an agricultural activity. There might be something there. I'm not sure how much is going to be there, but there might be something there. Okay. Um, I, I have a couple items. Uh, Chris, we talked about a policy change for donations. Is that something that future meetings? Policy change for donations? Yeah, we said we need to bring something forward. We explained what the purpose will end up being. So have that purpose fulfilled in the policy would have to be discussed at the board level for the policy change to even have that happen. Okay. Okay, so um, um, Andy left, so I didn't have a chance to ask him. Um, do we have a dollar cost on LED lighting? The dollar cost to complete the LED lighting in the school system here? And then we have some cost, because that, that rolls into the purpose thing, you know. So um, 
the middle school windows. We need a dollar amount for that. I can, yeah, I can come up with those. Um, there was some, um, I talked to Andy, I think it was last week when he was here. Uh, there was initially some software review on HVA system that yielded some positive results. Um, we had, uh, I, I understand that's complete now. We also had uh, some discussion about, uh, I think it was a prayer review of the new school, the lighting system in there, and how the lights are managed. And talking with Andy, he says there is software that manages the lighting system there, and he is going through with his team um, reviewing the software and learning how to use it. So um, I just don't know if we can have an update. I can either email Andy or maybe you could ask him or have him email me or something. I just want to make sure that stays uh, forefront and completed. Yeah, maybe you can just put a memo out to the board, whatever he's come up with. That'd be good. And then some of these um, other lighting systems in these older buildings, um, some of the classrooms, um, I'm just curious how we're turning lights off or using infrared switches uh, on timers or how we're doing that. I know the, I seen Stacy, you know, turn the lights off with a switch over there so but I'm just uh, wondering like in classrooms and things like that if we're using infrared or whether we're still relying on the energy program of the teachers uh, turning off the lights and things like that a couple questions I had so are we reviewing a donation program next meeting is that what's happening pardon me are you, when you were talking about the donation stuff, are we planning to review a, a proposal for a donation well, program? Well, I spent some time with Chris and we talked about some, how we would do that donation and how, what the purpose of that would be. And uh, I don't think we're ready yet. I think we need more discussion. Maybe some more private discussion with Chris, I think. But I just want to keep that forefront. Okay. Anybody else have anything for future? Okay. Then I will make a motion to adjourn to executive session for discussion of professional staff employment, contract renewal, non-renewal, and professional employment personnel update as provided under 19.851B, 19.851C, and 19.851F. I'll second. Okay, roll call vote. Steve. Tony. Yes. Dale. Yes. Anna. Yes.